Mary, can you hear me? No, she can't. She can't. But the sound should be going to the other uh, one. No, not the alpha. Right. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Can you hear me, Anne? Yep. Can you hear anyone else? Or only me? Good morning, Anne. Can you hear me? This is Nadla. Yes. Good morning. Um, and you're unmuted. Is that going to be okay first? Okay. All right. Thank you. And good morning, Charles. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. In a very first 21st century way, we're now working with the technology. <laughs> I'd like to read the statement. I was going to try something else really fast. Okay. Here's the you. Can you go to your. Jabra. Great. Go ahead and just leave like that. Okay. Um, I'd like to begin the meeting by um, reading the board's statement of public participation. The Board of Public Education encourages the public to participate in board discussions. Persons who wish to participate should sign the public comment sign-in sheet and identify themselves to the board chair or executive director prior to the board's consideration of the matter for which the persons are concerned. Anyone wishing to participate in board discussions will be recognized by the chairperson in keeping with normal board parliamentary procedure. We discourage public comment on personnel matters and ask that you discuss these issues in private with the board chair. The Montana Board of Public Education is a professional development unit provider. Attending a Board of Public Education meeting may qualify you to receive professional development units. Please complete the necessary information on the sign-in sheet if you are applying for professional development units. So thank you. Um, We'd like to begin uh, next. Uh, offer uh, any members of the audience to introduce themselves uh, and say good morning. Good morning, Board of Public Education. I'm Amanda Curtis. We think we all know each other, <laughs> with one exception, but thank you very much for your work and I've been a great couple of days. I'm the president of the Montana Federation of Public Employees, representing almost all school employees um, on K-12 public campuses and the university system and community colleges. Thank you. Good morning, Christy Steinberg. I know many of you as well. I'm Director of Accreditation at the University of Montana and our accreditation is up for review today. So for that and also the practice accomplished. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Just don't worry about me tripping over the court. I, I don't look very agile. I am. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Ron Slinger. I have the great honor of being the uh, ninth president of Miles Community College. I'm just starting my fourth year now in January. Uh, and I'm uh, very excited. Thanks for inviting me there. And we're happy to uh, be represented here. And also, and I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here with you. Um, I'm very honored and humbled by the governor's um, selection. And I look forward to working with each of you. So, thank you so much. Any members of the audience or uh, online? Okay, great. Um, so first item on our agenda is the consent agenda, which includes the minutes from the November 17th and 18th meetings and also the financials for the Board of Public Ed. Um, uh, 
and then exclusively in this one. Sorry. Um, I, I'm, I missed it for the second time in the in meeting. <laughs> um, our next item on the agenda is public comment. Is there anyone here who would like to make public comment on items not listed on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to the consent agenda. Again, it's the meeting minutes for November 17th and 18th, 2022, and the financials for the board. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. It's been moved by uh, board member Lacey and seconded by board member Hammond that we uh, adopt the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no? Motion passes. Okay, next item on the agenda is the chairperson's report. She made yeah. off. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, next item on the agenda is to adopt the agenda. Does anybody have any changes to the agenda or um, comments about the agenda? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the agenda as presented. All right, thank you. Good team here. Uh, it's been moved by Board Member Lacey and seconded by Board Member Hammond that we adopt the agenda. All those in favor say aye. Uh, Okay, okay. Is there any public comments? Is there any board member comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. I miss your coach. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next item on the agenda is the chairperson's report, and I have a few items I want to share. Um, first, I want to begin our meeting by recognizing board member Tammy Lacey for her seven years of service to the Board of Public Education. Um, this will be her last meeting on the board, um, and we do have an agenda item on Friday to honor Tammy for her service, perhaps make a few speeches, but I wanted, to, I wanted to acknowledge her up front today so that board members and other attendees can visit with her over the next two days and thank her for her service and contributions to K-12 education. Thank you, Madam and then next, I'd like to give a shout out to the Montana School for the Deaf and Blind for being selected as a state finalist in the 13th annual San Sun Solve for Tomorrow STEM competition. Uh, congratulations to the students and educators at MSDB, and a special thank you to Paul, Superintendent Paul Kirkmeyer and his leadership team for continuously seeking out ways to bring technology and innovation to visually and hearing impaired students both on campus at MSDB and through the school's outreach program. So MSDB is one of four state finalists for Montana. The other finalists are Capitol High School in Helena, Sentinel High School in Missoula, and Whitefish Middle School. And each state finalist has already won a package of $2,500 in technology and school supplies. And then these state finalists advance to additional stages in the national competition that will culminate in three schools nationally, being selected in May as the national winners, and they will receive $100,000 in prize packages. So congratulations to these four schools and best wishes in the national competition. Um, since November, I have participated in the meetings of the board's licensure, accreditation, and legislative committees, as well as the bi-monthly meeting with the Montana School for the Deaf and Blind. I'm pleased that the licensure committee has reviewed the final changes to the educator preparation program standards in Chapter 58 and recommends uh, the approval of the notice of adoption, which will be um, the board will be considering today under Item 13. Uh, the Accreditation Committee has continued to review the proposed changes to the standards of accreditation in Chapter 55. And tomorrow we will, under um, Item 23, we'll, we'll be picking up where we left off in November in our responses to public comments on the proposed rule changes. And it is our plan to get through all the remaining comments at this meeting so that the board is prepared to approve the notice of adoption at its meeting in March. Um, the board's legislative committee meeting is committee is meeting weekly with our executive director during the legislative session to review proposed legislation related to K-12 education and to prepare for both the Board of Public Ed's and Montana School for the Deaf and Blind's budget hearings. 
and our executive director, Michal Quinn, will be sharing more on this topic. But I did want to mention that uh, both board member Renee Rasmussen and myself plan to attend the budget hearings uh, for the Board of Public Ed on February 1st and MSDB on February 2nd. And it will give us an opportunity to introduce ourselves to the Joint Appropriation Subcommittee on Education and answer any questions that the legislators may have with the board. Um, related to the budget, I would like to thank the governor's office for including both MSDBs and the board's budget requests in the executive budget. Um, we especially appreciate the governor's recognition of the needs of the Montana School for the Deaf and Blind related to increased enrollment, family outreach and engagement, facility maintenance, and services to help students in the transition to the workforce. Uh, and finally, I want to recognize our executive director, McCall Flynn, for her excellent work in facilitating the Seal of Bioliteracy and completing its development in time for students to be recognized this school year. Uh, this recognition is an excellent service to Montana students as they move into post-secondary and career opportunities, and it also supports efforts to strengthen the number of native language speakers in Montana. So, good work. Thank you. Um, that concludes my report, uh, and unless anybody has any questions, we'll go on to the executive director's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you stole a little bit of my finger for my update, but um, I'll just continue to still hit the high points. Um, I do want to thank all the folks at MTSBA for allowing us to meet here. Um, this will probably not be the only time we're going to be here, given that the legislature is at the Capitol probably through April. Um, so just really grateful to them for allowing us to use this really nice space and um, to help us with all of our technology needs. Um, those things are very much out of my hands. Um, a few general updates. Since our last meeting in November, uh, we've been working really hard in the office to finalize the Chapter 58 Notice of Adoption that you'll all see, uh, seen, but we'll vote on later today. Um, and then hopefully be finishing up Chapter 55, um, both of which, like I said, we've discussed later this meeting. Um, we also participated in the final Education Interim Budget Committee meeting in December, where the committee determined that the economic impact statement related to Chapter 55 um, carried an insubstantial cost to the public, uh, which is a good thing. <laughs> so we'll repeat this process as the board reviews content standards related to standards of accreditation. Um, if you remember at your meeting in September, I believe, um, you all approved math and world languages. Um, though I do see that there may be a further discussion about that timeline um, moving forward. But nonetheless, uh, those those uh, rule changes will also have to go through the same process like we did with Chapter 55. Um, we've also actively convened our board committees. Um, it seems like there's a committee meeting almost every week um, to discuss accreditation, the legislative session, uh, MSDB and licensure. I'm just really grateful for board members and your ability to step up and participate in those. It's really helpful to us in the office and makes our work in the interim a lot uh, smoother as we prepare for meetings. And then aside from general updates, um, you'll see in your packet that I do want to give an update on the legislature and the seal of biliteracy. I'm going to do the seal of biliteracy first, and then we'll talk um, about the legislature. <clears throat> so starting on page 55 of your packet, You'll see two documents related to the seal of biliteracy, which are specific to the decisions made around native languages. Um, and I should point out our beautiful logo at the top of those, I just think is so nice. Um, but I, I think it's the first time you've probably seen it in the packet, so I wanted to point it out. Um, I just want to remind you that the process for qualifying for the seal of biliteracy in native languages mirrors the class seven language and culture uh, specialist process. Um, which, if you remember from Chapter 57, is really based on, based on authorization from the Tribal Council or Tribal Government that basically just states that the applicant or the seal of biliteracy meets the standards and criteria that they themselves, the Tribal Government, determine. Um, so there's still some work to be done on that, but you'll see it, the first document in your packet is a draft memo of agreement or understanding. Um, that states kind of what the qualification, certifications, and attestation between the tribal government representative and the Board of Public Ed. Um, 
this document basically states that you know the eligibility requirements and competency standards that are expected but again the specific criteria standards will be developed by each individual tribe and a lot of that work is already happening which is why um, the committee and then this group really made that decision to allow them to continue to develop that um, I should let you know that, um, well, I'll go to the second document really quick in your packet. It's the application that is specific to the native language, given that the, um, the process is a little bit different, the application itself needed to be a little bit different as well. Um, the criteria section really allows for the appropriate official to outline that description of evaluation process and the, a brief illustration of what the student is able to do in that language. Um, again, this is just to show that they've met the criteria based on whatever that standard is that the, the tribal government set. Um, I did share both of these documents with Macy last week. Um, I know uh, Vice Chair Hedlund was on, um, and I think the group was really impressed with the work that's been done, and I think that they were grateful that um, given that Native languages are different, that we're treating them that way and not expecting um, you know, to fit a square peg to a round hole. Um, so we're, we're trying to make some um, some of those changes that make sense given that the language is a little bit different and the application is a little bit different. Um, we really would like to get this information out and post it as soon as possible. Um, the first applications would be submitted in May. So we wanna make sure that we can do this as soon as possible so that, um, school districts can start planning for this. Although I do know there are a lot of school districts that are already planning because they've reached out and are like, when are you gonna get the applications on your website? So um, I know people are waiting for that, which is exciting, but um, wanted to make sure that, of course, you all saw these in case you had any feedback or questions. Macy had none, which I thought was um, positive, but certainly wanted to make sure that this group had a chance to look as well. Madam Chair, um, Board Member Lacey. What uh, is the plan for communicating with school districts? You can work through SAM or NCSBA, both? Both. Okay. Everyone and anyone um, will really be using the MALT group as well, the Montana Association of Language Teachers. Um, they've been really active in this process and um, have given us their word that they will um, help spread the word as much as possible. I know that they've already um, kind of been putting the word out. They participated in uh, a number of the education conferences this fall um, to kind of put it on people's radar. But we'll use them as well to get the word out. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from board or comments from board members related to the seal of five years? Madam board Chair, call, um, is this, are we focused right now just on um, native languages as a rollout, or are we going to include other languages in the future? Yes, both. Um, sorry, uh, board member Tharp. The, um, we'll roll out for every language. Um, it's just that native languages don't have like an existing exam already. Um, so like if you were taking Spanish, there are a number of exams that your Spanish teacher, for example, would give you in school. And there's ratings and criteria already set for those. But native languages, because um, you know they're typically developed at the local level, don't have that type of um, criteria already set in those uh, numbers to go along with it, I guess. Um, so that's why we're treating them differently. But they will both be rolled out. Um, this is just kind of like the last piece of the puzzle that we had to get done. I'm sure we we reviewed the the other one September. September, September the September September meeting. Board member Hammond, I just wanted to compliment everyone who's had a hand in this. It was very exciting. We may be the first when we vote in native language services, and I think we need to. Some publicity about the business as well as our traditional communication channels. Yeah, Board Member Hammond, I do know, um, just to comment to that, I do know that um, Washington State has done a lot of work in this area. And um, I actually reached out to them when I was developing this because, you know, where do you start? And they gave us a lot of good information. Um, but they did tell us it was a lot of work to get off the ground. and. Um, but there are other states kind of dipping their toe in this area, but I think that it still deserves publicity for sure. Any other board member comments? Okay, thank you. And I just have one other uh, piece really quick to talk about the legislative update. Um, 
I know uh, Chair Quinlan already talked about it mostly, but just a quick update. Um, as you know, the legislature began on January 2nd. Um, I've shared with all of you the BB, BPE legislative playbook, which is just basically a document that outlines um, ways in which you can follow the legislative process, who's on each of the education committees, um, both lists of Senate and House um, legislators. Uh, so if you ever have any questions about that, please let me know, but hopefully it's user friendly um, enough that you know, if you have a question, you can look there. Um, additionally, I've been sending you our, our bill tracker um, that we've been keeping internally as we track bills related to the Board of Public Ed. Um, I should note too, as, as you get that, you may see some bills on there that you're like, this, what does this have to do with us? But you should know too that we track some bills related to um, like state agency changes um, or, you know, travel, uh, any, any of those bills related to like how we operate as an agency. So I realize sometimes those may not be totally relevant to um, the work in, in education, but wanted to make sure that those are on our radar because sometimes they may impact the work that we do. And then sometimes bills on there um, don't necessarily uh, impact the board, but may have an impact to education generally. And those bills also we just have on there kind of as an FYI is as we go through the process to so you know where um, those bills are at. Um, I also wanted to just quickly discuss our budget priorities. We've talked about these in the past. Um, and again, thanks so much to the governor's office for including all of these in his budget. Um, I, I think that is huge and we're very grateful for that. Um, so just to reiterate quickly, the, the three priorities that we have right now. Um, first, we've asked for an additional $10,000 per year. Um, which would be $20,000 total to fund basic operational costs, professional development, travel, administrative rule costs, et cetera. Um, things that we may have been able to do in the past and don't do now or new responsibilities to the board. Second, we've asked for an additional $10,000 per year, $35,000 total to fund additional costs related to legal complaints or legal cases, whatever it may be. Um, just a little background on that, fiscal year 2022, the board expended all 25,000 by March. And so we had to fund the remaining three months out of our operating expenses. And that's that can be really difficult, especially at that time, because we were also working through the license, the new licensure system. So um, just a lot of things at play, but uh, I think that having the additional $10,000 will help us get through a full fiscal year. Yay. Um, and then, Third, um, the board did agree to support the superintendent's proposal to divert the educator licensure fees from the Board of Public Ed to the Office of Public Instruction. We're grateful that the governor's office did um, backfill us with general funds to support that work as well. Um, so we'll, that is also noted in our budget. And then, um, let's see, uh, Chair Quinlan did mention that our budget hearing is scheduled for February 1st. It'll begin, I believe, at 8.30 a.m. if you're interested in watching. And the Montana School for the Deaf and Blind, I believe it's scheduled for February 2nd. Um, and just, again, just really want to thank the board uh, legislative committee. Um, it's a lot of work. They're meeting weekly. Um, so it's going to be a very active committee. Um, and just really want to thank them for um, kind of leaning in and participating in the process. That's all I have on the legislature. I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions for McCall and board members? <coughs> All right, thank you very much. <coughs> Superintendent Arts and welcome. Yes, we'll good morning report. and uh, happy new year. Right? I'm going to say Happy New Year all the way till December 31st because <laughs> there's hope that this year will be uh, not just the best for education, but for the best for us personally and for our families. So um, honored to be here. Uh, it's interesting how legislature has taken a hold and they were here you know, on a federal holiday. So we were busy working and our uh, we had a, a wonderful event at the Capitol discussing families and the bridging of the communication with families and schools. I believe it's really important that we do not have an us versus them discussion in schools, that we really work together. I know there's a, going to be a press and I'm sure the legislative committee is going to be looking at some of the transparency bills that some of the legislature is bringing forward. Again, the whole purpose of this is to have a robust discussion 
on what happens in education. Whether it's a view of curriculum, whether it's a view of timing of when that happens, or what is being taught in our school. Um, and I think that's part of your work as well as mine, to make sure that we can all come together in a great communication. Because it is about our, our students. And I'll say again, all our uh, parents are our very first teachers. So I completed, and I want to say thank you. You attended the event we had in Great Falls. It was very uh, well attended, very uh, good questions that came. Basically, what I did was pass the microphone in four different communities across our state in preparation for the legislative session, again, with the theme for bridging the communication divide for schools. We had a great attendance in Kalispell, uh, up in Stevensville in the Valley County, as well as in Great Falls and Billings. So very pleased that we had school leaders attend there because it is their voice that um, is what leads our, our teachers. We had um, our budget bill. I want to say in a partnership, thank you, MSPE, and I have it specifically for you. You, know, you were there in support of the budget, not just for our agency, but uh, also for our K-12. And very pleased that on uh, Monday, we're going to be giving a work session. And I'm sure the governor's office is watching and trying to understand what all the programming that we're working on. One of the things that I do want to say, and this might come into your world as well, is on measurement. Measurement of what opportunities you are doing and the not just the funding that goes to it, but the measurement of outcomes. And I know in our large agency of asking for almost $20 million to support the brick and mortar, the personal services, the employees at our agency, but it's also the programming. And I think that is a different turn that the legislature is seeking. So we do have metrics. We are presenting those. Um, and for your budget, I don't know if you've been asked uh, to have that backup of the money going to your outcomes, something new that uh, they are seeking. And I'm sure that they are going to be doing this through the interim as well. So in throughout my report, um, just to go through it, and I don't, you know, you've got it, you're going to read it. Um, I would like to say that I've got um, a few people that are online that can stand for questions. Uh, let's go through the MAST pilot program. And you'll find that on your, in your packet on page two of my remarks. Thank you so much. So within it, we have a new uh, second testing window is going to happen on the 17th. So it's just around the corner. And you can see the data that are there. We have 75 educators. We are impacting over 4,000 students within fifth and seventh grade in math and in reading. And there is quite a robust amount of tests that have been taken. Now, just to reiterate what this program is, it's a very um, through year, four times a year, where the test and the skills are partnered and paired together. And so that assessment reflects what that teaching is. More important, this is a collaborative effort with the educators and working with the vendor and of course the OPI and the school districts. We need to make sure that the teachers have all the tools, the teachers recognize what their teaching effect is. The other aspect of this, and Charles, this is dealing with you specifically, to have the, the student recognize the growth in learning, whether it's minimal or whether it's a large part of growth. This also is a reflection of personalized learning. So there is, uh, this is gonna happen um, uh, 17. And I also wanna say that because of the federal requirement, there will be the SBAC window that is also going to be opening. So the courageous teachers that are doing this at this time are also having to perform that summative test at the very end. But part of our programming is to remove that so that in the second and the third year that that will not have that double test effect. But at this point in time, that is important. I do believe I have Chris Noel our expert here that can stand for questions. And if Chris, do you have anything else that you would like to add to my report? 
dealing with the Montana um, assessment project. Welcome, Chris. Hello, thank you so much. I am happy to stand for questions. Um, I'm just working on getting in now that you promoted me to panelists. And so I'm here, I'll, my video will be on in just a second. Um, I'm happy to stand for any questions that anyone has. Okay, um, board member Keith, do you have a question? I do, thanks. Hi, Chris, good morning. Um, thanks for all the information about teachers that are piloting this. I don't know if you have this information, but I wanted more specifics on <clears throat> the feedback that teachers are getting after they mm -hmm. give these assessments. Are they finding it helpful, timely? And the biggest question as a teacher, what if a kid's not on track? Mm -hmm. What resources are available for me to help, yeah. you know, reinforce that trajectory? Yeah, um, board member Keith, um, board chair Quinlan. Um, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm really excited about some of the opportunities that we've had to connect with the teachers. Um, we launched a teacher learning hub collaborative space uh, before the holiday. And we've given every teacher who's participating the opportunity to join us in that space. Many of our specialists are in there um, kind of available to respond to questions. The very first thing we did in that space was to provide them a copy of the score reports um, and then to give them the opportunity to reflect a little bit on what the score reports are telling them, how easy they are to use, what they're learning from them, how they're similar and different from other score reports. And most importantly, to go through the descriptor for every item that the students saw and reflect on whether they had instructed on that content in advance of the assessment. We believe that those are really important conversations right now because they allow us to support teachers in knowing what meaning to make of the assessment results. Um, these items are still in field test status, which means any one of the items could be determined to be too easy, too difficult, or simply inappropriate for our students, for our representative sample. And so given that we know we have actually a relatively representative sample, we've started digging into some of those demographics and we found that in some of the key criteria, things such as um, students who identify as Native Americans, our, our sample is matching our state level demographics very nicely. And so we're very encouraged that by collecting this data, working with this set of teachers and finding the answer to the question, what does it mean? What does it tell us? What should my actions be? when I see that a student is or is not successful on this assessment. Um, a score guide was produced and provided for teachers that really helps them to think about if I know that I did instruct this material and students do well or poorly on individual items, what does that mean for me? If I know I did not instruct this material, what does it mean for me? And I think especially to think about if we're seeing that teachers are saying, I didn't teach this and kids are successful on these items, really helping teachers to then begin now that process of extending and expanding and, and modifying the materials in both directions when we see need for that. Um, and so right now we're still very much in a learning phase, but we're very committed to providing appropriate, robust and um, respectful spaces that kind of scaffold that um, in real time as teachers need it and meet them where they are. Um, we know as the superintendent shared that they are doing a lot of testing this year, um, and we want to make sure that every minute of that testing has benefit, even though we are in a field test status. Thanks, Chris. That really helps, and I appreciate having that space where teachers can go, because I think that's the be best method to learn from each other. I just want to put in a plug that I've heard from teachers like, okay, my kids are not getting this. I don't know what to do next. I don't have the resources or the professional expertise to raise that bar. And so I really think we need to look at what professional development for teachers should result of this process. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Other questions for Chris? Chris, I have a question. Can you remind us um, when schools volunteer to participate um, in this program, uh, did they commit to both grade levels and both subject areas, math and reading? Um, or are different schools doing different pieces of it? Board Chair Quinlan, um, absolutely the latter. Um, we have examples of schools where every student in grades five and seven across both math and ELA are participating. And I think our smallest schools for sure fall into that category. Um, I think we have one that has a total of three students, but it is all students in those grade levels. 
Um, then on the flip side of that, we have some other districts that even just have individual classrooms participating in just one content area. Um, and so we've allowed for that flexibility to ensure that each individual district can participate in the way that's the right fit for them, whether that is about staffing and having teachers who are comfortable with this, or it is about a larger district um, sense of capacity, we did make that the district choice. And does that create any problems for you in terms of um, distribution or validity of, I mean, I realize this is not a statewide assessment at this point, but just reliable and valid results. Board Chair Quinlan, um, yes and no. I think that in some ways it's beneficial that we have a more distributed sample because of this. Um, there are some of these districts that if they were to per have all of their students participated actually would throw off our sample because they have so many students um, compared to some of the smaller districts. And so um, I think that's one of the things we'll learn at the end of the year this year, and it will be something that we focus on as we recruit for next year, as we expand out the pilot further um, to make sure that we're continuing to match that statewide representative sample. And I have one more question, Chris. Um, does the TAC that you use, the Technical Advisory Committee that you use for STAC, is that the same group that's mm -hmm. advising you on this project? Board member Quinlan, yes, they are. And in fact, we are devoting all of our TAC time for this, um, at least for this first half of the year. Uh, all of our TAC time has been devoted to this or our peer reviews. Um, I think the board is aware that we, uh, part of the federal process that we go through is going through a process where our assessments and our practices and protocols with assessment are subject to a peer review process. And so right now we are in initial peer review on science because that operational assessment just went live. And so now is the moment when we submit that initial peer review. And so all of our time with the TAC is being divided between support for our peer reviews and support for this pilot. Thank you, that's helpful. Any other board member questions? Superintendent Arts. Thank you, great questions. And just to remind everyone, we're the only one in the nation that is doing a through year test that is really trying to align how teachers are teaching, what they're teaching to the outcome to the student in a through year manner. And really pleased that the federal government recognized this. But again, I can't say enough about it. If teachers don't participate in this, we don't get the really good understanding of it. So this is going to be going off quite some time and more information will flow. But um, we have extended membership on our TAC meetings uh, to a full 10. And these, uh, this is something that every state has. And I'm sure you're aware of this as well. So we're really excited about this program. So there's more to come. Thank you. Um, you bet. Throughout the uh, process, we've uh, also had a request on data modernization and uh, Data modernization was one of the things that was requested from the previous legislative session to use some of our great ESSER dollars that came from the congressional action. I do have our expert, um, Chris, uh, who is our, Chris Denrud, who is our chief information officer on for any questions. It's on my page three. So it would be your page, 62. 62. Thank you. Um, we are working with Microsoft and really seeking, you know, what does the field really recognize and use? Because if we change anything at the state level, it's definitely going to ripple down into our school systems. And so we want to make sure that we have a product that is amenable to who our customer is, as well as in working with the state CIO to make sure that whatever we do in our systems at the state level is also going to be beneficial if there's any data transfer by any means. So um, we are working through all of those hoops and I say them as hoops. One of the things that I am proud of with the state, but it's also a challenge is our state procurement laws are exceedingly tight. And that's good because it protects that precious taxpayer dollar from possibly a predatory vendor of some sort. But you can imagine as large as our uh, state is with IT and moving a large system 
uh, and incorporating schools now into this and Department of Labor, possibly even OCHI into this. It's taking a lot of communication and we want the right vendor. So it's not something that we're taking lightly. We're taking it very carefully. The other thing that data modernization is, is an inward look at who we are, how we communicate, even in a phone system, with when we have our customers or constituents call into the office to make sure that our employees um, are robust in communicating with them. Also within the systems of who we are in communicating with our customers. So we've looked at the Teams report, which is where accreditation, where chapter 55 is, and how that future view is going to be looked at. So there's a lot of things to come on that. And I know that uh, Mr. Sinner here can answer any more questions that you might have or of myself. So Madam Chair, I would offer, I see he's got the big sky blue and the A-plus brand up on the screen. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chris. Uh, are there any questions? Are, are there any comments you'd like to make? And then we'll open up for board uh, questions. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and, and board members. Uh, we're really excited about this project and we can't wait to uh, clean up and uh, work through a lot of the challenges that we have internally um, with some of our systems and consolidate a bunch of that work. Um, we're really thrilled that we do have the ESSER funds that are helping us do that. And we're right in the middle with, as superintendent said, working with Microsoft to get further down the road. So we're super excited about that. Thank you. Any questions from board members or comments? Um, board member Headland. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain kind of the vision for how this will work with schools. Are you guys working on having it be a statewide system where it will be linked to the school districts and data will flow so that we will no longer complete the toes and teams and those sort of submissions? Great question, um, Madam Chair, uh, Board Member Hedlund. Yes, uh, one of the things that we are doing uh, is essentially with our SIS and understanding that there are many of those across the state is working on consolidating a lot of those efforts. So the schools do not have to enter things into multiple areas and it's all consolidated. And we're looking at that as our architectural basis for cleaning up a lot of the systems that we have. So the intent is to clean up um, all of those aspects to make it easier on the schools and the districts as well as internal staff um, may not be widely known, but um, I know the schools have to do some duplicate uh, duplicate and duplicative uh, efforts to enter data and whatnot, and we do as well. So there's a lot of challenges with that, but that's the whole point of this project, and we're excited to go down that road working with the schools to clean up a lot of those efforts to make it much simpler on those. Myself, I really detest entering things in multiple times, especially when you get into companies. And so rest be rest assured that that is one of our main focuses is to clean a lot of those efforts up. Other questions from board? I'm sorry, uh, board member Rasmus. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, well, you talked about going down, but what about, you know, to school districts so that, uh, the, uh, the reporting to you guys would be, <coughs> please excuse me, be uh, maybe one report. Uh, would that mean that school districts would have to change their student information system as well? Everybody would have to go to one? Or are you looking at requiring vendors to be able to upload to whatever it is that you um, end up utilizing? Uh, great question, um, Madam Chair and um, board member. The short answer to that is yes. Uh, the best thing would be to have one SIS system. However, this is Montana. Everybody thinks differently. Everybody's independent. And so we understand those, um, what would you call them, characteristics and character traits within the state. And so we appreciate that and we understand uh, those challenges. That being said, uh, we are really excited um, with 
um, working with Microsoft and the Data Lake technology and Snowflake and uh, the different SISs out there that will be able to allow that data transfer to be a much more easy type of uh, work effort. So we're uh, in the midst of working with uh, our SIS right now, as well as Microsoft and um, also looking at uh, some of the other SISs out there for transmitting that data into our system, uh, which there's one of, as you know, um, and maybe down the road, we could get down to the point where there is one SIS, um, but right now we know that that's uh, certainly not a, a work effort that we're looking at doing. Really the important thing is, is getting the data as easily from the schools to us into the uh, manner where that data can be analyzed and utilized. Follow up, Follow up. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, we've talked about up and down. What about sideways? Because a lot of times we have to report data to other agencies. So what about, what's the plan for that? Um, Madam Chair and uh, board member, that's exactly the whole point of doing those data lakes and making sure that um, with that technology, the way we build right now, what our, what our problem is, is we have um, our foundation is not set well with our data. And so we have to clean all of that up in order to make these systems uh, available and the data available to other entities, whether that's back down to the schools, whether it's to DLI or OCHI um, or uh, corrections, for instance, or DPHHS. And that is going to be the basis of our architecture is to build this out to where we can and will be able to easily share this to whom uh, is authorized to that data, making sure that it's secure and safe as well. One more question. One more follow-up, follow please. You mentioned the word snowflake. What in the cat hair is snowflake? Well, uh, Madam Chair, board member, um, Snowflake is a technology where you can put data uh, out there for others to view and have access to in a safe manner. So if you um, think about it from a database standpoint, it's a place where data is stored and others can access it that are authorized to get to that data. Um, but is kept under lock and key until we know exactly who's supposed to have access to it and is granted access to that data. And is Snowflake a Microsoft product? Um, Madam Chair and Board Member, no, it is not. It's a, there's a, all kinds of data lake. It's a data lake technology is what that is. And uh, it's just one of the many that are out there. It's the one that the state is uh, currently in use of and um, that's one of the reasons that we want to tie in with that um, because that helps cover um, anybody that is currently a snowflake subscriber has access to that which is most of the state agencies right at this point in time other mem board member questions uh board member tharp yeah, madam chair it's Senator and i appreciate hearing that you guys are working with microsoft I mean, from my time in north dakota when you as soon as you get your teaching license or uh, license and you start working in a school you have one email address and that email address works no matter if you change school so as i log on my uh, my browser history and everything stores all of the previous emails from all the other places i've been well in north dakota you have just that one and it does streamline things but then also that email address gets you access to the full microsoft suite and so all teachers have that immediate access. And I know of schools that in, in an effort to try to trim some funds and save some money, they are eliminating licenses for Microsoft and have told teachers, well, we'll continue to pay the license, but it's that $100 fee is gonna come out of your $200 classroom budget. So half of your budget is just so that you can use Microsoft in your, within your classroom as a, a teacher. And, that's not an issue across the border. They, everybody has access to that. And, and I appreciate what you said about the SIS, but that's another issue that, that has been resolved across to the East. They have, everybody is on the same SIS. So everybody has that, the same platforms, the same student information system. And I can tell you, it, has, it makes things so much more streamlined. But 
of course, it took an infusion of cash and it took the state in order to oversee that because then the state oversees the IT in the schools. The state oversees the student information system, but that makes things so much easier than when it comes to how do we then report like what Superintendent Arthur is talking about, the test scores, because they all go, we don't have to deal with how do you get access to your test scores. The state gathers all of that into that one system and it's all there. And so being able to centralize things it just made life so much easier over to the east and I had and I had to confess that I had to repent for all the North Dakota jokes I told growing up because <laughs> they're on top of stuff with their technology and they have really made the life a lot easier for the schools but yeah and I agree with you the uh, the the biggest hurdle in Montana or two of them is going to be the money and then the especially the largest school districts that may have uh, SIS different than infinite campus but I applaud your efforts to keep trying to get everybody on the same page. Madam Chair, uh, Board Member Clark, thank you very much. Uh, it certainly is a challenge. Uh, we know that and we're up to that challenge and we'll uh, expect from help, especially from you and the board when we get to have that opportunity to go down that road. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Are there other board questions? Uh, board Member Headland. Thank you. Um, can you share with us uh, the timeline or some kind of plans for the completion of this project? Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Board Member Hedlund, yes. Right at this point in time, we are looking at uh, having our contractual agreements uh, hopefully done by February, and we're going to get started in uh, March with some of the newer uh, tie-ins with uh, building this platform. The uh, first efforts that we're going to look at are uh, tying in teams uh, we know especially with the chapter 55 challenges that are coming um, here come july uh, we have to be ahead of the game as much as we can to try to implement those so we're ready for all of you come july 1st uh, so that is our focus right at this point in time and we have an, about another seven or eight other applications that we are um, going to tackle right after that so um, those are fine points that we're working with to try to uh, nail down with our statement of work that we're working with uh, SHI uh, through to Microsoft and get those things all nailed down. Um, when we have those, uh, we can look at the work efforts that are that it's going to take to get those uh, lined out and worked through. Um, but we're ready to tackle that as well. And those timelines will be out as soon as we have them. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board member questions? Thank you very much, Chris. We appreciate the information. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Any day. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you. I just want to reiterate, you know, they gave these dollars. They were the federal dollars that were captured when the legislature was in session. And then they pretty much shared with us what we were going to be using the dollars for. Uh, the dollars came to us uh, July 1, uh, right after the session. Uh, in 21 and within that following year within not even one year we had teaching Montana TMT up and that's where we focus the data modernization knowing who we serve as that teacher so we did that as well as single sign-on which is an app that uh, allows for a clerk or a superintendent to be able to have one screen have one access portal to type in if they need to go to nutrition or they need to go to anything else that we offer at the Office of Public Instruction. So you don't have to have duplicative sign-ins or when you close out of one, you have to reiterate and get into the other. There's been multiple other things that we have done. This one is very, very large. And making sure then that we connect with the state, that we connect with procurement, that we connect with our uh, constituencies um, is the last big hurdle. And I also want to say this, and I'm, I want to be on the record with it. The amount of money that we received, we're very grateful for. We could never have done this without that infusion of the congressional ESSER COVID relief money. It's going to take possibly more. What I have encountered, especially with our Teach Montana site, there, uh, there is a ongoing cost for technology of maintenance. 
old government used to be you hire the programmer, the programmer would live within your wall of your agency, and you would then be able to amend that program with that entity. That's not the case going with the technology that's now in a lake or in a snowflake or in a, uh, a model that is different that the state is working toward. So making sure there is maintenance dollars um, is what I'm alluding to. So we're not asking for this session, but there may be a request in the future to maintain all of these systems that better serve our schools, that better serve our state than the other agencies that we network with, just to say. If I could move on then. Sure, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Merkel, I believe, is online to answer any questions. There's a couple of things that are within my report. The 1% waiver that has to deal with um, assessments. And that is something we have to ask the federal government for, dealing with our students of different abilities. We found that throughout the pandemic that uh, more students uh, needed more access. And because it increased the threshold, we then had to go to the federal government to ask for a waiver to serve those students. That will be with our smarter balanced test with normal population. And then the population of different abilities takes an alternative test. So that waiver has gone out. We sought public comment. Also then, as I've alluded to, the uh, federal COVID relief money. And in your packet, there were three tranches of monies. Uh, we did not have the ability in the time frame to send it down to zero. There was money left on the table. I had no other recourse but to send it back to the federal government. And we're hoping in this next tranche of money and in the final that is to be liquidated in 2024 that we can get to a net zero. There is a lot of dollar in our public school system and there still is a challenge with schools getting a contractor, getting that big expensive item across the board because of pipeline issues that Montana as landlocked as we are, is, we're dealing with. So we are doing everything in our power with our federal partners to see, and with the new congressional, um, new Congress being sat, to hopefully that there will be a little bit more leeway in allowing these expenditures. So our schools can spend the money and spend it in a manner that is an investment. So uh, with that, Dr. Mergel, uh, I have you on. Is there any question or anything further? She's not popped on. Do you want to do your next item? In the of course. Deck? Transportation. Uh, we have Danelle. Danelle has been, Rosenthal has been part of our team for many, many years. And she works within uh, transportation. Just to have you understand that the state remits 50% of bus transportation costs. Uh, in the county then does the other 50%. So there is a transportation board of the county, as well as uh, the program that runs through our office to make sure that those dollars come back into our, our school districts for that. A lot of challenges with employment. There's a help wanted sign in every business as there are in schools for everyone that serves our children and also talking about bus drivers. One of the things that we are doing is um, having our uh, Safe Montana Drive, that's in Fergus County. We are having that incorporated into not just bus drivers, but we are now finding that there's a shortage of CDLs, commercial driver's license. So we're going to be um, asking that that, and we don't need any approval, but asking that through a big consortium with our trucking companies across our state, not only with bus drivers, to be able to have trucking companies use that platform, they would then remit a fee. That fee would go into state special revenue account. This program then would be a net zero and possibly a increase in funding to support more resources for our school bus drivers. And I've had to amend it because we need a new track. We need new equipment, uh, whether it's a snowplow, whether it's a different type of a bus, whether it might be something else. 
So that program then will enhance and stay special revenue to get more um, bus drivers, as well as to increase the amount of activity with truck drivers and CDL operators. So it's a great partnership that, that we're working with at this time. So I hope Danelle is on. I think I see her. She can stand for questions or anything else you might have regarding the transportation report that you see. Great. Thank you, Superintendent Artson. Good morning, Danelle. Um, are there any comments you want to make before we move to board questions? Um, no, I think it's a it's um, pretty easily viewed and understood by what Superintendent Arnson has, ju has just explained. Great. Are there questions from board members? Okay. Uh, board Member Hammond? I'm interested in legislation that's come up about seatbelts or further safety and security items and what you're projecting on that legislation and the costs. Uh, I can answer um, with that one. Thank you, uh, Chair and Board Member Hammond. We are watching these. I know um, when I was a legislator, these opportunities also came in to the committees. They did not have a large lifespan, but the number one thing that we want to make sure is that there's school safety. We also want to make sure that there is choice within uh, the many, many bus routes that we have across our state. And it is a budgetary item, even though I shared in my opening that the, cost, the costs are there uh, that are, are borne on the back of the state, all taxpayers, as well as at the county level. But um, Danelle, I don't know if you have anything else to say, but we are definitely monitoring any of these that come into transportation. Um, I have a oh, sorry. oh I, I have a question. Um, Danelle, the um, I'm looking at the numbers for individual contracts, so paying parents uh, to transport their children to school. Um, the, the number of contracts have gone down and the total amount is below the peak of a couple of years ago. Um, so how do you explain that? It seems like with a shortage of bus drivers, I thought I had read that there was an increase in number of individual contracts. Um, I, I don't really have an answer for that. Um, I noticed the same thing as well. And I know districts were also, um, um, you know, combining their routes as well. So they may have been able to cut down on those individual contracts. Thank you. Uh, any other board questions? All right. Thank you, Danelle. We appreciate your being with us today. Thank you. So I thank you, Danelle. I just texted and I thought she was on earlier. She's not responding. So I don't know what there would be, but I can answer any questions. Want to say that our first day, we had the family event at the Rotunda. The second day, we had quite a panel of uh, unique uh, and stories that were shared from different superintendents across our state regarding the investment. And I call that an investment in the ESSER dollars. Um, it is. It was recorded and it's on our website. Um, if indeed you'd like to receive any of that. We also have the Department of Education on and Dr. Lane uh, has been uh, a great partner for us to understand what data collection, what questions we might have. He has always been available to answer anything that might come up within ESSER. And um, really, really pleased that we also, on Ian's aspect, and Dylan, maybe you could share a little bit more with that, the monies that the governor received are called gear monies. And with our Ian's program, which is a non-public program, we received two, uh, two buckets of those because of our procurement laws and just because of who we are in Montana, going to our non-public partners, we could not expend the amount of money. So I reverted that back to the governor's office in the, in the advent that he could then 
use those dollars for any other capacity. Some of those dollars may be coming back to the Office of Public Instruction in a couple of different types of programs. And I don't need to put you on the spot, but if I'm waiting for Dr. Merkel and if she cannot come, Chair Quinlan, if we could then go to uh, our um, expert here, Mr. Klattmeyer from the governor's office, just to share that partnership. Uh, yes, that's not in my I report. think that's appropriate. And if uh, Julie uh, can join us at some point, that would be great. So, good there. All right. Um, Dylan, good morning. Would you like to uh, share a report from the governor's office? Good morning, sure. I'm happy to respond to some of the Eve stuff or give my full report. I don't want to cut off Dr. Sorry. McLean. She's ahead of me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> So yeah, the uh, Office of Public Instruction, the superintendent remitted about $6 million in emergency assistance to non-public schools funding back to the governor's office. Um, the time period for distribution of those funds to non-state entities expired with the federal fiscal year last year. So we're in kind of an interesting position in that the state has to actually expend these funds. They can't subgrant it um, to other entities. So right now, the governor and the budget office, um, in, in coordination with the superintendent, are determining the best agencies to allocate those funds to um, for purposes of, you know, teacher recruitment, retention, work-based learning, um, and student mental health. Those are kind of the, the buckets that the governor has been very interested in. Um, so we're looking at at DPHHS. We're looking at. Um, sounds odd, but giving some of the funding back to the Office of Public Instruction where they'll have additional flexibility to use it for things like their teacher residency program. Um, and then of course, the Department of Labor and uh, OG, those are kind of the primary state agencies that we feel can best spend those funds. Um, and so I will have, a, I, could, I could bring an update in March probably on that. It's still to be determined, but we're looking at those four agencies for kind of those, those purposes. Dylan, could you just take a minute to explain the difference between the EANS funds that you're talking about and the ESSER funds? Because it's the EANS funds that are heavily loaded. Correct. So the EANS funding, um, I believe, was part of ESSER. It was a, a, a small bucket for assistance to non public schools um, in Montana. Due to the nature of our, of our school system, there wasn't heavy interest. Um, in homeschool or private schools utilizing those funds. And so the way that it works is if the Office of Public Instruction was unable to spend those funds on non-public schools, um, the federal law says that it reverts to the governor's office to spend his year funding, which is governor's emergency education relief funding. Um, there was two iterations of that funding very early on in the pandemic. Um, the executive director Flynn was involved with the uh, distribution of the first round. Um, and then shortly after Governor Jean Forte came into office, the second round of gear funding was uh, was expended. Um, and then there's been an additional, I guess, yeah, this this additional non-public school money came back to the governor's office as basically a, a third round of gear funding. But and with the caveat. Yeah, the timeline, the funds um, have to be ex completely expended by September of 2025. So we do still have some time, and that's why we're being pretty thoughtful about it. Um, however, if we were going to subgrant them to, say, a non state entity, that would have had to have occurred before September 30th of last year. Um, and we felt that rather than try and hurry up and subgrant those funds out. It was better to be thoughtful since we have a couple of years and see which state agencies could best spend that funding. Okay. I could just interject. Thank you. Chair Chair Dylan, I, thank you. Thank you. And, and board. the uh, other aspect of this is we are being held accountable at the state level. Uh, we have a program manager out at uh, in DOE and we have monthly meetings with the budget office as well as with our CFO and our uh, great people that are deploying the dollars to make sure that we're doing this with fidelity. And we all recognize that money is not free. There are strings attached to it. And the, the biggest challenge that I've had to deal with, not just with the EANS dollars, but with the ESSER dollars, and I'll say this again, 
is the added data collection, the added emphasis for our schools to have to go into our e-grant programming, go into and uh, pretty, pretty much give us more dialogue because the guidance from the federal government has changed and will continue to change as this thing moves forward. Concerned with the new Congress being set, that other things may come down in any type of a matter, whether it's less flexibility or more flexibility, we don't know. But because of that, it's really important to have a great, robust conversation with the governor's office and the budget office, because Montana is being held accountable, not just my agency, but all of Montana is being held accountable. So we take this very, very serious. Um, Dylan, do you want to complete the governor's office report and then we'll go to OG? Thanks, Chair Quinlan. would be happy to. Um, so, um, yeah, I just want to start off. The, the governor appreciates board member Lacey's um, service on the board here, including her tenure as chair last year. Um, and we're, of course, excited to welcome President Slinger uh, to the board. The governor was uh, thrilled to appoint uh, Ron. He's, as he said when he introduced himself, he brings, um, I think, a really unique and exciting uh, perspective to the board and that he is the president of a community college in eastern Montana. Um, and he's developed a lot of relationships with Eastern Montana high schools and has a really proactive um, dual credit program. And so I think he's going to be able to uh, kind of bridge the discussions between K-12 and post-secondary. So we're excited to have the board, Ron. Um, yesterday afternoon, I don't know if you've had a chance to review it because I did just send it yesterday afternoon to your executive director, um, a letter from the governor encouraging the board to adopt those graduation requirements for personal finance or economics um, and then civics or U.S. government. We appreciate the Office of Public Instruction bringing that. Yeah, appreciate the Office of Public Instruction bringing that recommendation and the board is considering it. The governor feels that those um, are really important um, skills and uh, areas of education that high school seniors should graduate high school with um, in order to be prepared to enter college or the workforce. Um, my report is going to be very brief. I just, you know, I thought we had a really good joint board of education meeting in November. Um, there is a, a bill that's being carried to reduce those meetings to just one a year. So I think we'll just always kind of plan on those joint meetings being that November meeting if that works for both boards. Um, going forward, but I just wanted to expand on some of the legislative priorities that the governor talked about um, in that meeting and where those are at right now. Um, as you've already heard, uh, the Office of Public Instruction's funding requests, the Board of Public Education's funding requests are moving along uh, very smoothly. The governor supports the board being fully funded, um, regardless of whether it's through special fees or through backfill to the general fund. We want to ensure that you have the funding to, to operate and be able to fully um, do your, your duties. Um, just uh, this week, it looks like the K-12 inflationary funding bill um, had its hearing and should be moving through house um, education here pretty quickly. So that's good. I know it's a priority for the superintendent to get that moving fast. Um, on the innovative education program front and the Big Sky Scholarship uh, tax credit, those um, are going to move forward as one bill again. I know there was discussion about splitting those into two bills, but Representative Benton and Senator Solomon are working together. Um, the Department of Revenue took the first stab at drafting a bill on that. Um, it increases the funding for both the public uh, side and the tax credit side uh, to up to $5 million um, from the current $1 million. What still needs to be worked out um, is how to change that formula for the distribution of the innovative education program funding. If you remember, um, that was where a large chunk of the funding went to one school district last time. And so there are a group of legislators working to, to thoughtfully, thoughtfully figure out how to um, best distribute those funds across the state. And um, I've heard discussions that that might involve the board's input in, in helping get those out. Um, we're working with um, Superintendent Arnson, State Special Education Director, and Representative Benton on the Special Needs Education Savings Account Bill. Uh, last session that was introduced, it did not pass, um, but we're looking at it again. I've gone through a lot of the technical notes um, to really get it cleaned up and think that uh, getting having some more time to get input, it'll be in a, a better position to move forward this session. 
Um, Representative Jones and Senator Solomon are working on uh, with the Digital Academy on some bills. That's a high priority for the governor is to uh, make sure that the Digital Academy is, um, you know, modern and fully responding to all of the online learning needs of students and districts across the state, especially in light of um, the pandemic over the last couple of years. There's a lot of um, resources out there for online learning and the Digital Academy views it as an opportunity to really revamp rebrand and reinvent themselves and um, figure out the best way to deliver their their services out. So there should be some exciting um, legislation coming from Representative Jones and, Jones and Senator Solomon on that front. Um, Representative Wendy Boy is looking at expanding the Tribal Computer Science Scholarship Program. Um, if you remember last session, there was a bill that allowed um, each tribe to send two high school educators to one of the Montana University System units to get um, training over the summer in computer science um, to bring back a computer science program to their high schools. Uh, we're looking to expand that and allowing them to send an elementary or middle school teacher now as well. Um, with uh, from the interim transformational learning, um, Senator O'Brien is carrying a bill for section E from the interim to really tighten up that transformational learning program, better define proficiency based learning um, and provide some increased funding for that. So we're keeping an eye on that. Um, we're looking to set up a, a 250th commission um, to uh, basically bring together civics groups um, and schools, um, veterans organizations to start working on uh, civics initiatives leading up to 2026, which will be the 250th anniversary of the founding of our nation. Um, and so I, I, I'll keep the uh, legislative committee up to date on that, but one of the things that I think we'd like to look at is having this commission work to get um, the citizenship test in more schools. It's encouraged in law right now, and we would just like them to, to help schools begin to implement that, especially um, if the board's looking at requirements for government um, and civics, that could be a good opportunity. Um, on Monday, Representative Beattie has um, an open enrollment uh, public school open enrollment bill. Um, it's having its first hearing. Um, so I'll, I'll be over there for that. We think it's a really good opportunity right now. Open enrollment in the state is pretty patchwork. Some districts are doing it, some aren't, some charge tuition, some don't. Um, and Representative Beattie's bill, I feel is a good way to um, kind of standardize what open enrollment looks like um, in the state. And most importantly, um, that the funding is, is flowing appropriately and fairly to the district of attendance versus the resident district. Um, so that bills on Monday. As Superintendent Arnson alluded to, there's a variety of legislators looking at curriculum, transparency bills, and parental rights bills. So um, I'm just keeping an eye on those, working with those legislators, um, hoping that we find something that, that works for, for families and for the schools to implement. Um, there's probably going to be two different charter bills. Again, haven't seen draft language on those, but continuing to take, stay in touch with those sponsors, Representative Anderson or Representative Finn, um, to, to make sure that those bills um, are coordinated. Um, so Dylan, I yeah. might stop you. Uh, we're a little bit running a little bit behind and I, we also have a legislative committee that are going through some of these. So is there anything else you wanted to highlight particularly? No, actually, that was the last one. So, no, those are just. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. Let's get to turn into LC. No, 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 no. No, that's that's all I've got as far as major bills. If, if I could, if I could, uh, Madam Chair, just just add to this. I have, uh, as a legislator, in four terms into this into this thing right now, and state superintendent. There is more focus on education, post-secondary, more focus on education in our K-12 system than we've ever had. And we want to get it right. So I believe our conversations for the next 90 days are going to be robust on these topics. And we need to make sure that we are a local control state, but we also need to reflect um, that we can have best practices. And I definitely want to say again, this is about our teachers, this is making sure that our system reflects of who we who we are, but where we want to be as well. So there's going to be this is a robust session on education. So I recognize that we're very busy. You're busier than ever, and I know your legislative committee will be as well. 
Uh, thank you, Superintendent Arson, and thank you, Dylan, for uh, your presentation. And I'm going to, uh, are there any board member questions before we go on to uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Lochin? Uh, Renee, you look like you were. Okay. Good. And Anne, did you have a question? Okay. All right. Um, Angela, good morning. Welcome, Dr. McLean. Um, would you like to share information from OG? Yes, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me, and I will be I will be brief. I know that uh, you just indicated that you're behind <laughs> schedule a little bit. <clears throat> um, so very good to see all of you. Uh, I'll welcome to Mr. Ferdmeyer back there. Look forward to your report. And I do have to say there are three of us from post-secondary education in the room this afternoon, and that might be a record. I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe when we have an accreditation visit or, or a follow-up on that, maybe we have a few more, but this is pretty exciting. And I'd like to uh, congratulate my colleague, uh, Ron Slinger, uh, for his appointment. I think that voice on this board uh, from post-secondary uh, is going to be very important. And we have a seat at the table, certainly from the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education, but to have a voting member. Uh, be somebody who works on a post-secondary campus, I think, uh, is unprecedented, right? So wonderful. It's going to be, I think, a great opportunity for the students of Montana and I think for this board uh, to even, uh, it, it, in so many different and new and exciting ways, continue to connect its work with post-secondary education and workforce development. So look so forward to working with you, Dr. Slinger. Uh, a lot is happening at the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education right now. Um, just as uh, Dylan indicated, and as the superintendent indicated, folks are knee deep in legislative items. In fact, just as I started my report, I just uh, heard from Deputy Commissioner Thigpen about our tracking list, and our tracking meeting at 11 o'clock. So we're knee deep in that. Um, it is a, a very exciting time in, in public education across the state. And it's nice to see that everyone from the governor's office uh, to the Senate and the House are focused on putting students first. And so we all look forward to seeing how everything evolves and materializes this session. Additionally, our office, as always, is knee deep in, in everything college access. And right now we're preparing for an event uh, in April, the first week that would allow students and counselors to circle back and focus on college applications that they might have started, but perhaps didn't finish. And if they didn't complete the FAFSA, uh, we would encourage them to take that uh, first week in April uh, to make sure that they're uh, reasserting the importance at the school level of completing those applications and of completing the FAFSA document. So many correlations between students completing that document and their ultimate uh, attendance uh, and participation on our college campuses. And then, of course, Decision Day, which is the first week of May, we would encourage our counselors and our site coordinators during that week to uh, prompt their students to solidify their commitments to a post-secondary campus or a post-secondary workforce opportunity uh, as, as they have chosen. So we're knee deep in that and we're working on right now uh, putting together our boxes that will go out in fall to 250 plus site coordinators, uh, program coordinators for Montana Educational Talent Search and liaisons uh, this year. And we'll, we'll have those ready here in the coming months. So college access is, is certainly a focus and, and a priority, and um, we're, we're moving things forward. Additionally, on uh, American Indian Minority Achievement, a lot of good things are, are moving forward there. We have a couple of videos that are going up on our, on our website uh, on that front. The AMA Council has submitted some recommendations to the Deputy Commissioner. Uh, depending on uh, timing, we, we would like to see those new recommendations uh, on the Regental Board as early as March, but we'll take it if we can at least see them by May so that they can be implemented um, by next year because we really believe that uh, making sure that there is intentionality when it comes to American Indian success uh, on our campuses uh, is, is really the difference maker and the game changer for, for, for American Indian student success. Uh, then on to Gear Up. Once again, thank you to all of you for having uh, the Gear Up director as well as the METS director make a presentation this fall when you were up at the Capitol. Our Gear Up director did move to the to the Department of Corrections, and he's involved in a very exciting uh, educational role there. So, so we wish Dr. Anderson all the best. Uh, that said, we are right now right in the middle of a search for a new Gear Up director. 
And uh, if you know anybody who might be interested in that, uh, please have them go to mus.edu and uh, make application. The search closes next Wednesday and we hope to move fast and get somebody really good uh, into that very important role. On that front, the Gear Up team that I am currently leading. So now three different titles uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, are, are leading my signature line. And what I'm sharing with you right now comes directly as a result of uh, the Gear Up Interim Director title that is part of my signature line. And this is Gear Up Goes to College. And all the month of February, they work with college campuses across the system and they rotate from year to year. So if Dr. Slinger, you don't see Miles on here, it's because they rotate from year to year. Uh, and these are the campuses that they're contacting this February and students in the liaison and school leaders can tune in uh, to each of these uh, meetings on these dates and times certain uh, to explore post-secondary opportunities across the state. And I wanted to make sure that you had this because you too uh, are, are invited to participate in them. Additionally, we have Montana Educational Talent Search and you heard from Jeannie, a lot of wonderful things continue to happen uh, on, on that front and with that program. This year, they have a student leadership track and they have 16 students participating from six different school districts and they participated in a kickoff conference in October. Bless you, uh, Edwin, <laughs> I saw that. And um, I think uh, one or more of you in this room uh, has been contacted at least for the October event and you may be contacted for subsequent events because part of what they do is they try to connect the students uh, to leaders across the state. And so I think a couple of you have already engaged in, in visits with some of our MET students. And then Montana's Future at Work, we're preparing the second RFP for that grant, grant that is funded by the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation very successful model around workforce development and marketing. Miles was one of the grantees and they're doing extraordinary things with their project there in healthcare. Uh, Bitterroot uh, doing some pretty cool stuff with their project there uh, in regard to healthcare. One of the things that I think is really innovative that is emerging from this is uh, the partnerships with the with industry. And I would just point to what is happening in Butte in particular with uh, Highlands College and Northwestern Energy and the municipal government in Butte to boot. And what they have done is they have stood up a CDL program for high school students with what is called the Class B license so that they can get their CDL and get credits for college too. So dual enrollment is a part of it, it had to be. Um, but they can do this and then hopefully graduate high school with a CDL and then serve their, their municipal government and also go to work for Northwestern Energy. So one wonderful and exciting innovations out of this first round of grantees. We can't wait to see what the second round uh, is, is, is going to, to lead to, but, but we're really excited about it. And again, we just cannot thank uh, Mr. Mike Calligan and the Dennis and Phyllis Washington enough for that investment. We think it's a, it's a real game changer because it does allow some flexibility uh, for our campuses uh, in making sure that they have the resources to market. Uh, their programs that are workforce uh, in nature. And then finally, uh, the Grow Your Own Montana Educator uh, Spring 2023 is off and running. I'm caught off a call with our campuses from yesterday. Uh, I don't have numbers because we won't have a final census count for several more weeks. But I think we definitely are looking at doubling from where we were last year. And last year we were at 55 students. So we're very excited. We're, we're also seeing some good innovation there. And part of what uh, grantees had to do was signify to us how they were going to put their program in a place of sustainability. And one of the models that we're seeing is they're developing uh, a plan for the acquisition of textbooks. So not only will it reduce costs, for students year in and year out because they won't have to buy the textbooks. Um, but what they're doing is they're buying them and then they'll just check them out to students uh, through, through this process. And so it will certainly uh, lend itself to the sustainability of the program uh, and the programs that they've started in communities like Haver and Great Falls, the both high schools there um, and at Blackbeam College. So they're just really right now taking some steps towards making sure that their, their programs are sustainable and um, that uh, they're serving students well and making sure that they stay in the pipeline for uh, uh, 
complete opportunity to eventually uh, serve our students in the classroom as, as classroom educators. And then finally, uh, educator recruitment and retention, just like uh, it is for the superintendent's office, continues to be a priority uh, for every single one of, of our Montana University system campuses. And I do say that while we have our four-year campuses who have uh, been able to offer their standalone educator prep programs, we have our two-year campuses who have been long plugging into those four-year campuses to offer things like two plus twos um, and other models that have worked successfully in some of those communities where they don't have their standalone EPPs. Um, but it is something that I think is happening very intentionally across the Montana University system. Conversations are happening with our campuses in the Office of Public Instruction right now around expanding the residency model uh, and delving into something new uh, around the apprenticeship model so that we can get uh, appropriately licensed and prepared teachers in the classrooms where they are needed all across the state. And with that, Madam Chair, that concludes my presentation and I will stand for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, any questions from board members? Oh, it's just one comment. The board member for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. As you get ready to work into this um, business of having an apprenticeship, I would really like more information on how I can go to see you. Awesome. Super. Yes, and that was actually a conversation, interestingly enough, so SHEO, the, the National Organization for System Heads for like the commissioner and the deputy commissioners, uh, they were engaging our office in, in conversations and we were just getting to the place where we were going to start looking at our campuses uh, that we could pilot with, and then the office of the commissioner the office of the superintendent, I think they got uh, pretty excited about apprenticeships too. And so I think as we go forward, we'll both have, a, a, have an oar in the water and move that forward. And I don't think either of us are absolutely certain as to what it will look like yet, but I do know that I think both agencies are incredibly interested and we think that there's a lot of promise. Other questions or comments from board members? Uh, if not, thank you, Dr. McLean. Appreciate your report. Lots of exciting stuff going on. Um, and next, uh, our student representative, Charles Fox. For his if I could, Madam Chair, and Charles, I apologize. I do need to depart. Um, I know that Dr. Merval will be here uh, in discussion for anything that you might need because uh, you have other things on the agenda that she's going to be presenting. So we can ask her for that. I just want to make sure that we're all buttoned up with that. But I wish you all a happy new year. I started it. We're going to finish it. Thank you all. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, it's awesome to be back uh, meeting. Um, I'll start off by talking about a little bit about OESC. Uh, we met, the executive board and I met on Monday for three and a half hours to conduct some interviews for our new executive director. I'm happy to announce that we made our selection, Mr. Ryan Anderson, who is the District 2 advisor and who just coordinated a super successful uh, student conference with over 500 people. Um, he was selected as our new executive uh, director, Great Falls. Oh. Great Falls, and we're super excited to follow his direction as um, we kind of come out of this COVID era and hopefully try to build MESC at what to what it once was, um, but also change up a couple of things. So we're super excited about that. Um, and around the state, clubs like EPA, uh, HOSA, Key Club are all planning um, their spring meetings to elect new leadership and MNSC is no different. Um, around the state, all six districts are planning, well, except for district one, which hasn't been active, but they're actually gonna hop in with my district, district three, which is super exciting. Um, so the whole state will be represented. We're planning our district meetings to elect new leadership and new presidents, um, which means a new executive board from ASC. Um, and then our spring executive meeting, which we will meet the new presidents and the, the outgoing presidents. Um, and also to interview for a new student representative to the board which is super exciting because at the conference I gave a report and there was a ton of interest. Uh, I think last year we had seven or eight applicants and I at least had uh, like 15 people come up to me and talk to me and ask questions about this position. So I'm really excited and I hope that um, this new interview process for the student rep is super because we'll get a really good one. 
Um, but that's how MIC is doing. And then you guys will see on your agenda for today that we have a student panel, uh, student engagement, which I am super excited about. Um, it's been a couple of years since we've been able to do this and you have all members of the MAC executive board, student board, um, either tuning in online or coming in to Helena to talk to you today. Um, they're really excited. I think they're a little nervous, but I told them how to be nervous. Um, it's an awesome opportunity to ask questions, to talk to students. Um, the awesome thing about MAS, the MASC board is that it's always super diverse. So we've got students from small schools, big schools, all around the state represented here. Um, so it's gonna be a great opportunity to ask. We've developed some questions here, but if you guys come up with anything else, you feel free to ask. We're excited to have this experience and opportunity to actually talk to you guys. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Any comments or questions for board members? And, and uh, board member Keith. Hi, thanks. Good morning, Charles. Um, this might be for your panel, but I'm putting you on the spot because you just mentioned it. I've talked to many high school clubs who are basically decimated after COVID. How do you get back better than where we were before? Off the top of your head, what's what's the key? Yeah, it's really tough because you went from pre-COVID where you're doing everything to COVID where you're not, most schools aren't even meeting um, and there's no way you can have a club. I don't know, I personally, all our clubs were closed. Um, our accounts were closed like money wise. So it was just, it's just that the first task is finding students who are passionate about it to open these clubs back up, find advisors. Um, but once you start that, you just need those passionate students, but people are excited to do things. Students are excited to get back into the group. Um, and we found that at Helen High with leadership and especially Key Club, um, which I'm part of, we have 40 members and we're, that's one of our strongest clubs at the school. It's just, about consistent meetings, um, consistent ex expectations, and uh, you kind of just have to start doing fun things that are going to get students interested. Um, and that's how we were able to kind of rejuvenate the energy at Helen High. Um, and that's happening around the state. Um, you'll talk to Abby Burns today from CMR, and she, her friend Della Everhart, um, is involved is she she's the governor for key club and key club is expected to have one of their biggest years this year um participation wise people are just super excited to get back into the group and we saw it at the MSC, masc conference um it's just that starting part of finding a couple students who are passionate and are willing to um handle the administrative part of getting a club going and figuring out when you're going to meet and the logistics of it so thank you i appreciate it look forward to your panel thank you i think we all look forward to the panel this yeah. afternoon and i just want to point out that is item 15 on the agenda we uh should hit that point about three o'clock this afternoon great thank you charles uh sure why don't we take a uh, 10 minute break and um we will pick up with uh msdb after the break so if you could be back at 1020, that'd be great. Uh,
Yep, we'll get started. We'll reconvene uh, and uh, next I'd like to turn it over to board member Lacey, uh, who's the MSC liaison. Uh, thanks for the vote. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate this opportunity to um, introduce Paul Brookmeyer, the superintendent for MSDB. And before I let him begin his report, I do want to thank him and his staff for a uh, wonderful formal dinner that McCall and I were able, able to attend on December 18th. It was absolutely lovely complete with blow-ups outside, um, commemorating the holiday season, amazing meal, an incredible program about um, Shep the dog from Fort Benton. And, uh, it's, um, and it's significance to MSDB, which I had never truly understood until that evening. And uh, Jim, come on, just a great um, program for us to have that understanding. And so thank you for your hospitality. It was, it's been, it was just amazing. And if any of you have the opportunity to attend a formal dinner, you all receive invitations to them. I would highly recommend it to be able to see kids in a little bit different setting um, with families and the staff there all dressed up and enjoying good fellowship and food together. It was really beautiful. So thank you so much. And I'll just say thank you for the opportunity to become part of the MSDB family over the last couple of years as liaison. Uh, it's really been my privilege and because I live so close, I won't be going away. So uh, <laughs> I look forward to more interactions with MSDB. So with that, I will turn it over to Superintendent Bruce Meyer. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Lacey. It's kind of, uh, I was going to end with this, but I'll start with this. I moved to Great Falls to be under Tammy's leadership. I was able to serve under Tammy in a different way than I thought it would. So it's been a pleasure working with you. So that was going to be my last comment. Emotional. <laughs> but thank you. Yes, and thank you for coming to the formal dinner. And we invite any of you. You know, I some I know some live across the state, and it's not possible. But for some of our kids, it's the only formal Christmas dinner they get, or the formal Easter dinner they get, or Thanksgiving. So it's important for us the week before we send them home for those holidays that they get a formal dinner that they, some of them don't get at home. So we're, we're fortunate enough to do that. Uh, first of all, Happy New Year. Um, it's been a busy one. It's uh, been a good one. I want to tell um, Board Member Tharp, congratulations on his appointment out there as um, Superintendent of uh, Richland, I believe, right, County? I don't stalk you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen stuff. I'm going to report it. So I didn't notice that. I think it was Kurt Miller or something on here. Uh, just a few things I want to follow up on between Superintendent Arnson's um, conversation and then Mr. Klapmeyer's conversation. I think they're important for you to know as board. Uh, the, the first, I don't know which gear funding it came out of, but I know Dylan and Nancy Hall worked with Governor Neil Forte to uh, find some money for us to work on some HVAC control panels that during COVID we found out that weren't working uh, and that we really needed to adjust the airflow in the building. And um, they've recently found us the money to do that. So thank you to Nancy and the governor for that. Then Superintendent Arnson as well and her um, Wendy Fonz specifically helping us find some money for a, a database. And Dr. Murgo was initially in that conversation, finding a, a money to develop a database for our outreach program because not all the students in the outreach program, well, none of them are part of our actual student information system. And we had a hard time tracking the kids that we serve especially after COVID and especially in the Bozeman and Kalispell areas where it seems like people from out of state or something happened in those two areas in the state and we are very much um, under, we don't have enough consultants for those areas and I'll talk about that in the governor's budget here in a second but um, appreciate her and Whitney finding us money to have that developed and we're having that developed from Ed Power 
uh, formerly Silverback, for those of you that have been. And we chose them because they understand education and they, they really understood what we were trying to do with having intake forms that are specific for blind or visually impaired or deaf or hard of hearing. It was a very unique ask. We were able to do that. So appreciate uh, Superintendent Sarnson and everybody that helped make that possible. The, the other thing I want to kind of talk about is a little bit. Uh, Superintendent Sarnson talked about me being at the listening session. And um, the one thing I asked for in that meeting, I asked for a few things. If anybody knows me, it can never be just one. But <laughs> one thing I asked for is we really got to start working on the interpreter problem in the state of Montana. And um, through that listening session, it's already started uh, a very interesting dialogue. I think a positive dialogue because I've been asking for dialogue with certain individuals with, about interpreters for the last couple of years. But the next day we had counselors from Great Falls High calling us. They had, you know, kind of going back to Dr. McLean's uh, grow your own kind of model. How can we start these students at Great Falls High? How can we carry that into a, a college environment? How can we do that with like an apprenticeship on your campus? So it started the conversation. We're, we're years away from probably the solution, I feel. But it would be nice if we started that grow your own and um, provide side classes in, in, in public high schools. We do with Great Falls Public. Um, and then have a second course where they, uh, just like I know my son who wants to be an elementary a teacher wanted to go to CMR and take a class, the education class through that grow your own program, but something like that for interpreters. And then find a, and, and maybe uh, it's Mr. Slinger behind me, I don't know, but really find a, a Montana institution that will work with an interpreter program because there's not an interpreter program in the state. The closest one is Idaho State and all their uh, graduates end up in Boise. So we're really looking for that connection with the Montana Higher Institution to start working on this. Um, uh, before I go into a couple more things, I know it was mentioned this morning, our school is a, a, a finalist for the Samsung um, grant project. This is the second, second time MSDB has been named as semifinalist. The first time was in 2019. We received, I believe it was just short of 25,000, so we didn't win at all. Um, but that, then COVID came and we didn't get to go to New York. So I don't even know if they finished that competition that year. I don't remember, but we ended up with about 25,000. In addition with that, the same teacher, Aaron Barr, wrote a grant for code.org and received that grant as well and brought in equipment to begin teaching our students more about computer programming. Uh, we had a computer programming class about three years ago, and that was uh, for the deaf only. It was developed for deaf, and, and we tried to have our visually impaired students do that class as well. And it was a little tough because it was built for deaf. So now we'll have a platform to do with both of our populations. And uh, hopefully in the near future, you'll see an article coming out about uh, we're really trying to focus our students on the future because one thing that is sad uh, is it's hard to place our, our, our students in job employment. So if we can't place students to get experience in job employment, it's hard to get them jobs in productive sense society. So we do have an idea of uh, working with the Department of Labor out of the Great Falls office to try to start working on that. And I think it's just a matter of educating businesses and business owners that our students can do something within their organization. Um, and and think, thanks to Governor Gioforte's budget, there is a transition coordinator in his budget that would allow us to work on that. And, and actually, we would try to fill that position with someone that's worked in the boat rehab or BLBS kind of area that understands that connection to what's going on there in the communities and the business. Um, other things that in the legislature, I know you have your, um, your group, but it, I included our budget. I'm not gonna go into it too much. I just wanted to talk about one is the, the, the individual that will help hopefully start working with businesses in our community. Uh, we also, 
the governor's put in his budget for maintenance stricter. And I, I, I don't know how far back this goes. Um, I don't even know if I think superintendent, well, not superintendent, she was to me, but Ms. Lacey might know if she's been on the board long enough, but there really had not been a long range building program at MSTV for some time. And we've changed that over the last three years. And now right now, 75% of my job is being the maintenance director because of all the projects. So we're thankful that the governor has put that in his budget and hopefully legislators um, uh, keep that in the budget as well. The other one I really want to point out is um, the governor has put in two outreach consultants in our budget, which we truly appreciate. We don't, to be honest with you, know how many outreach consultants we need because that can open up with, we don't have that database that gives us that number right away. We've never caught up with COVID. So we are very pleased to have uh, in the governor's two, there's um, legislatures from around the state calling and ask if we need more, and we're going to let them decide that. We're going to provide them the data that we do have, and if they want to add more, um, we would certainly appreciate that, but we can't say right now that we need 10, we need 12, because we just don't have the data yet. Once we get that database going, the next session we'll be able to present a little bit harder data. Uh, but that's out there. We, we appreciate that because especially, like I said, in the Bozeman and Kalispell areas, our numbers have really increased. The other thing we're starting to see in our bigger cities is in the state of Montana, a teacher of the deaf or the teacher of the visually impaired is a special needs teacher. So we're starting to see some districts across the state take the TODs and TBIs, put them in special needs classroom because of the shortage of special needs. So we'll push the first phone call after that happens. Our consultants say, and I just served 40 kids, now they're on your, 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 your caseload because we're not going to serve them as a TOD or a TBI anymore. So now you need to pick up those services. So that's another issue going on with our caseload. Can't tell you numbers. Okay, don't have that database, but it, um, it's happened at least in one community and two, I think, of the bigger cities so far in the last couple of years. So, Dale, please let the governor know we really appreciate his work in, on our budget, and hopefully, the legislatures will adopt his budget for us. And we'll see if the other legislators feel the need that we need more outreach. Any questions up to this point? Any questions, board members? Um, uh, Dylan? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minor, Chair Lacey. <clears throat> what, uh, Superintendent Firthmeyer, what, uh, what data? Do you need um, is is it something you can get from existing state agencies that we can help with, or was that that data question just like you guys went forward? We MSD probably probably has the the data. We have to put it together, and it was never in an electronic format. So right now, I have our outreach consultants and my outreach director going back and going back the past years and writing down how many students students they serve, what kind of students they serve. Uh, one thing that we, we will be presenting, and I hope they can give you even at March or even sooner, is we didn't really have a tool to calculate, justify what an outreach person does. I have one person that covers the entire eastern part of the state, and, and the driving time could be two hours just to go serve two kids and two hours driving back. And, and I don't know if their past formulas that they use really took that into consideration. That's just one example. So we, we surveyed our outreach department, surveyed four different states and developed a tool that we feel fits Montana that has everything like doing the assessments on a student when they're first born, driving time, writing reports, IEP meetings, you know, phone calls with parents, everything that our, we want to do as services. And then put the numbers in there for calculating how many, what it would look like. So I see So I'll get those that data to you as soon as we're putting it together as we speak. So thanks. Um, board member Headland. Thank you. Um, more of a comment. Uh, I just want to say, you know, I work closely with Katie James, who is one of your consultants, outreach consultants, that um, it's a critical service for our school um, to help guide the services and understand the needs of our students that um, are deaf or visually impaired. And so 
I just wanted to mention that um, it is a critical service that's provided to us and, and we'd be lost without you. So we really appreciate your staff and um, even, you know, have an email today from her. We're in continual mm -hmm. communication and um, she really helps helps our staff so that we can do our best to meet the needs of those students that um, we have in our districts and also give them some more opportunities and, and um, plans for the future and transition and all of that that you're discussing and how important that is. So I'm glad to hear that it's being supported and and uh, look forward to seeing your data. It sounds like a lot of work. Thanks, Board Member Headland. Katie is a great example of what I'm talking about. Katie serves from Anaconda all the way down to, well, we do have a, a gal, a part-time consultant in the Dillon area that kind of takes out, but Katie does take care of Anaconda all the way over to Sweetgrass County, all the way up to Helena. So she is responsible for consulting with every kid that's deaf. She's on our deaf and hard of hearing side. That's a level one through five service. And one day I should probably come and talk about what those levels are. We will when we put this data together. But that's a great example. So Katie herself probably has about 140 kids on her case. And if we start talking about classroom size, it's 150 is a max, you know, but then you start adding traffic and all that. It's just a, a real big need right now. And again, we're supportive. We, we greatly appreciate the governor adding to his budget and we'll, we'll bring the data forward and see if it justifies maybe asking for more or maybe two more is exactly what we need but it, it is um we don't feel as an organization we're serving the students in the way we probably should so we'll be coming back with data and, and there we go so so now i'm going to go on to the part where i i, I mentioned the board uh chair quinn please stop me at any time <laughs> because we have so much going on at MSDB. I could probably sit here for two or three hours and just not make <laughs> about this stuff. Uh, because I'm proud of our school and especially our staff that they're dealing with me, pushing them forward and trying to better the school. And they're right there with me and um, couldn't do it without a staff. So one thing I was asked to talk about is myself and two of my staff took the class at MSU on proficiency-based education. Um, I really enjoyed that class. They broke it up between administrators and teachers, which I thought was very unique and, and I think good in my, in my opinion, but it's exactly what MSDB is kind of looking at. So I was asked to kind of talk about that a little bit today is how are we doing about proficiency based. So three years ago, we started this notion of balanced lesson plans. So making sure our lesson plans have the standards in the lesson plan that the kids need to know. Uh, since that time, we've done a lot of work on what, what is a standard and what is in the standard and uh, really breaking down. We talk about verbs and nouns in my building. So we, we take out the, the nouns and that's the concepts that we need to know. And then we take out the verbs and that's the, the level we need to teach them at where the student needs to show proficiency at, at the end. Um, so we're going to continue building on that because one thing that is large in proficiency based education is the SEL standards intertwined in with the, the, the content standards, giving those students the belief that they can do those standards, they can get to it. We talk about depth of knowledge in our organization, some use Bloom's taxonomy, um, but so those students can believe they can do a depth of knowledge for type of an activity. So we're, we're just getting ready to embark on implementing those SEL standards in our actual lesson plans. And, and to do that, we're actually working with the Southwest Montana School Services. They're coming up to do presentations for us. And we've also now been working with Everyday Speech, has a great program for our population on social emotional learning that will be our tier one type of a program. Um, so with the standards we're, we're, we're beginning, and some of this might sound like some schools have been doing this forever, but it's, MSDB is just starting to implement some of this, this terminology and this stuff. So we're really starting to develop interventions based on the standards and the lack of where the students are not meeting the standards, especially with literacy, since we were able to get the literacy grant funding helps support these programs. And that's why, um, 
literacy is off to a decent start. SEO is going to be off to a, a good start because that's where we put our ESSER funding was into our social emotional training, uh, making sure our adults were had SEO themselves and understood SEO. Um, so those two I look forward to next year really start to see some outcomes. Uh, and based off of those, we'll start developing assessments. And that's the biggest thing I found to be in proficiency-based education is how the assessments are created. You can't just take uh, wonders or study sinks. Are, those are our two packages that we bought, curriculums we bought, or not curriculums, materials we bought for literacy. It's not just taking those tests and, and having our kids test them. It's really being deliberate, what standards are in the lesson that you're teaching and what standards, what lessons make up the unit. And then let's build some assessments based off of that. And, and we're starting to work on that uh, through our SEL program. So when we have our assessments that are actually aligned to what we want to measure our students, um, that's going to be powerful. And here's why. You know, my, my, my son's at Great Falls High School. They take a test. And they're, they're pretty much at grade level or above grade level in most everything. And they do fine on the test, giving NWA as an example. Okay. But our students might come to us and they might be six or seven years behind in language. And so they don't understand the language of the grade level test. Or proficiency based grading, not grading, but teaching will allow us to have our classes develop based on the proficiency level of the kids and move them on forward. And that's where we feel we'll have strength. Uh, so a parallel project to that that's tying into this, like I tell my staff, because I got a puzzle in my head and one day they're going to see it. <laughs> because of literacy, we began to develop an MTS structure within MSDB. Uh, we now have tier one, two, and three in the literacy. Next year, we'll have the SEL component. But we've contracted with AIR, the, the American Institute of Research. I'm not sure if you know them, but I know. Um, oh, I'm trying to blank. Anyways, the lady that is charge of care actually has a house in Montana and loves work with Montana schools and we're working with Sarah Evans some of you may know Sarah I know she's worked for OPI in the past um, and, and really going to start working on the MTSS and in addition to that back to kind of uh, Mr. Klatmeyer's data question is we, we, we don't know what interventions are working or not working we have not tracked that data so we're going to use EdHub or Silverback uh, for our school as well to track our interventions and the progress monitoring. The one thing I really like about EdHub right now with progress monitoring is you can progress monitor up based on the standards. So all this will be coming tied together. So once we build our, our assessments based on standards, we can put those standards into EdHub and start benchmarking and proficiency, I mean, benchmarking and progress monitoring on those standards. So those two projects are kind of going together. So any questions on those projects? There's a lot going on. So my staff, there is a puzzle putting it together. Um, I, I, I was going to say this, and I thought she left real she did, so I'll say it when the plane comes back. Um, board member Keith has a question. Thanks. Good morning, Paul. Thanks for your work on all this. Since your district and your teachers are knee deep in standards, <clears throat> I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, math and literacy, does your staff feel like those standards need updating? Are they outdated? Or are you just at the beginning point where you're actually understanding what the standards are all about? Good question. Uh, Board member Keith, I, I would say we're at the beginning. And, and the reason I would say that is we are implementing Nancy Hall and Pete. Maybe it's Pete Hall, Nancy, I can't remember, from San Diego State University. Um, we're, we're using their PLC structure. And the first two questions on that PL structure is first, what is a standard and how do you break it down? And then the second part of that, that, that program is, or that PLC structure is, where are we at right now? And within that PLC that PLCs we're implementing this year, I have staff that could probably answer your question, but a majority of my staff never looked at standards prior to me. 
and, and are really still learning on what standards are and really probably do not um, provide a, a good answer to your question. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, maybe take 10 more minutes and uh, we'll, uh, we need to also get to the action. Yes. So just to, I, I just want to update a few things on, um, I don't know what happened on the 1st of January. But on the 3rd of January, we had probably about 10 applications come in. Um, and we are looking at possibly in March being almost fully staffed, which would be um, pretty amazing. And, and the, the, the governor's budget and the legislature, I know House Bill 13 only had the first reading, but that is a big right now um, selling point when we go out and talk to people that are maybe our ends and say, you know, we, you could be an LPN under us, even though you have the RN certification, but the pay is going to go up, and this is what it is. And plus, you get the benefits, you know. And, and I think people knowing, at least for us, that there there's raises possibly in the future under that House Bill 13. I, I think that's one of our big recruiting tools. Just want to give some up. Uh, Quick updates, I can go in much detail, but on our projects, our lighting project is complete. Oh. That was, that, that, that's been going on. I appreciate the state AD working with us and in that project done. The roofing project is complete. That was nearly a seven year project and it's now finally complete. But again, like I said, we're really putting a focus on uh, long range buildings and that and um, appreciate the governor's budget having a maintenance director position in there to keep items like this going forward. We will replace the bitter root, the sprinklers in the bitter root building this year. They're not, the, the sprinklers are out of date. And so um, that was put into the last legislative session. And so those will be complete this summer. And also where you have your meeting in the bitter root, you will, not this year, but next year, I guarantee you have a, a lift that will get a handicapped person down to the basement and the room. So the lift will be put in this summer. I uh, really appreciate the governor's budget again. Uh, we, in long range building, so a and &E, bringing it to the governor and having it put in the governor. We asked for four projects that we thought we really needed to happen this year. And, and I'm proud to say that all four are in the governor's budget and on the floor of the legislature right now. So appreciate that. And that, that includes a drop off loop. You've seen our parking lot. There's nowhere to drop off kids. We've had kids and staff walking in the parking lot. It's not been good. Um, neither our uh, gym nor our cafeteria have a sprinkler system. So they will now have the sprinkler systems put into them. And then another one that it's almost an everyday need anymore. I never realized it, how much I missed it. Is a, a camera system inside and outside of the building uh, for security reasons. I mean, we just had keys show up two days ago. We don't know how they came back. We missed it since like October. We ended up on a desk the other day and we have no clue. But if we had cameras, we could go see who went in and out. So this could be much needed for the student safety, um, especially now that it. it if you know our campus and right behind our campus is a big empty lot, it's going to be a multi complex housing division again, and we're going to have much more um, traction on our, our campus. That is where I will leave it, I believe, for, for this and move on to the agenda uh, or the action items if that is okay. Sure. So the, the, the action items that I bring before you is one is a personnel, the personnel report. You'll see that there's one resignation of a Taylor Davis, but she's moving from a part-time to a full-time position. So she, she's really staying with us. She's just moving into that full-time. Uh, we did lay off one, one staff member uh, before the probationary period was done, and that was our food prep gentleman. Since then, we've had uh, hired Dakota Randalls 
with food prep, and I know Tammy and McCall were able to have a chance to interact with him at the dinner. And he's a former student. So again, trying to bring our former students in and buy into our school, and he's doing a great job. We had a, a lifeguard, so I can tell you now that um, beginning here we had nobody in the pool. Now we have someone in the pool five out of seven days a week. And all of these students are coming from our science class at Great Falls High, uh, and it's great theater. And that's what we want to do with our tour producers, is that kind of a program too. And then we have family advisors. And remember, family advisors are those that try to help our outreach consultants out in the state. They could be working with the blind or low vision family, or they could be working with the hard. Uh, they don't work with our deaf, the deaf have deaf mentors, same thing. But just different names. And then uh, Shavy Hansen is a sub pair. This will be the first year. I think we have more subs pairs than maybe Great Falls Public does. Uh, and again, it, it, it's a recruiting effort. Shavy was a, a former outreach student of ours, and we're really trying to get back to that. And also, her husband is the president of the Montana Association of the Deaf. So um, excited to have her. Uh, so that would be the first action item that I would ask. Madam Chair, I'm prepared to make a motion. Back to you, um, Board Member Lacey, for a motion. I move to approve the MSDB personnel items as listed in the agenda packet and as described by Superintendent slash Maintenance Supervisor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. It's been moved by uh, Board Member Lacey and seconded by Board Member Hammond. To approve the um, action on personnel items. Is there any public comment? Is there any board comment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, the motion passes. Um, Paul, you want to move on to the out of state travel request? Sure. So the out-of-state travel, you'll see there is five requests for out-of-state travel, and I really like this list. Uh, usually when I come with out-of-state travel, it's based on education, and I'll explain why this is a little bit different here. So uh, our outreach director uh, would like to have her go to the National Outreach Forum, which is in Salt Lake City, May 3rd to the 6th. Then the next one, we'd like to send uh, some of our deaf and hard of hearing outreach. Uh, consultants to the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Conference, March 4th to 9th, Cincinnati. And then this is where I, I, I'm excited, is our residential program is starting to uh, provide development, professional development for themselves. And it's not just all about the education, but the outreach department's now getting, getting some training. We, our education gets some training, and now we have the cottage staff starting to get involved with some real good training. So a group of them would like to go to the National Student Life Conference June 25th to the 30th in Santa Fe. Um, we don't use MAT in our building. We use CPI, Crisis for Information, uh, Crisis Prevention Institute, I think. And we have uh, Yvette Smale is our kind of a director of that. And with our focus on SEL and trauma, there is a great conference uh, at the Annual Crisis Prevention Intervention Conference, July 22nd, 26th, that we'd like to send you back to. And then um, I would like to attend the National Leadership Summit, June 25th through 29th in DC. And just a little bit more about that um, that I forgot to mention is that's part of the, the 2025 federal initiative. And uh, Kirk Miller and Bill Daggett are running that. And there's eight schools from the state of Montana that have joined up for that. We've had our first. And um, I'm excited because we will be the first in any of these consortiums to be a state funded school, as well as a school that works with the population. And I'm really, really excited because Bill Daggett's wife created a school similar to ours in New York. And I can already see that the, the, the ideas and the resources from this are gonna outweigh anything. And so that National Leadership Summit is part of the LEAD 2025 initiative. So uh, Chair Quinlan, those would be the out-of-state travels I would ask for. I'm prepared to make a motion. I move uh, to approve the MSDB 
uh, out of state travel request as presented in the agenda packet and detailed by Superintendent Brookmeyer. Is there a second? <laughs> okay, it's been moved by Board Member Lacey and seconded by Board Member Rasmussen that we approve the out of state travel request. Is there any public comment? Is there any board member comment? Board member Lacey. I just want to thank Superintendent Firthmeyer for um, his diligence in making his strategic plan come to life because every single one of these travel um, requests here are to enhance the skills and strategies and knowledge of um, his employees and in those areas that are specifically been called out in your strategic plan. And so I just think that that is really um, deliberate work um, that you are doing and, and really working to make sure that your strategic plan moves forward and comes to fruition. So well done. Uh, board member has just one question. The CPI um training that will that the staff that you have going to that become a certified trainer out of that training do you know or yeah so okay. board member handling uh yvette is currently already a certified trainer okay um, this will add that aspect of trauma and sel into that certification as well great any other questions or comments from board members um Seeing none, uh, it's been moved to approve the um, out-of-state travel requests. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, uh, one more action item, but before I do that, I do want to thank you again, Board Member Lacey, for being with us. And you will be part of our family of our evening. Ask Mark Wilmark to call you. Don't know if he asked to say I'll be um, looking forward to that call. You'll be shocked. I can see it. Already had that discussion with the board. So, um, and the, the other Thanks thing I did up. fail to mention with the CBE is really looking for some funding and to pay our staff to come in over the summer to get trained on that. And then put stuff together because anybody who's been a teacher knows that it's hard to create those lesson plans and that stuff in the middle of the year. So again, I, I wanted to throw that out there because I'm a funny guy. But my last item, and it's not really a vote item this time, it's just the first reading is our school calendar for next year, which is in here. Um, we work very closely with Great Falls Public Schools to try to stay connected because we share students between both schools. Um, and then we have a committee that prepares uh, other calendars that our staff and parents can take a look at. So what you have in your packet is calendar draft day, which was voted on by 10% um, of our parents. Well, 10% of the vote was 10% of the vote with parents and 90% of staff and 60% of everybody else surveys choose plan A. So we will ask you to adopt that at the March meeting. And that's my report, Chair Clinton, board members. Madam Chair, I members. just want to add on to that. Um, Jim Kelly, uh, employee at MSDB, has for many, many, many years sat on the uh, Great Falls Public Schools School Calendar Committee. Um, I ran that committee for many years. Jim is a very valuable member of that committee and making sure that um, the, the, the calendars uh, align um, because we want our students um, to have the best experience possible in most places, but also have the opportunity to travel home. So uh, I just want to give a shout out to Jim Kelly and his, and his work um, to make that happen with very student-centered approach. Thank you. Uh, Paul, I have a quick question for you, even though I hurried you along and now um, it, it has to do it on your budget. I see that you have a you have a debt service payment and I'm wondering what that is. Uh, it's on the first page of your budget analysis. So is that the governor's budget or is it on our yes. report? Well, it's the legislative fiscal point. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. I, I but, can't answer that, but maybe Mr. Klatmeyer can. I, I do know that it might deal with there was a service now a program that state agencies were working with, and that service did go away or change or something. And I know it played with our, our budget a little bit, and I think that might be what that has to do. Maybe we all are dealing with those. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
you know, to pull it up. I don't know. We could ask somebody, we could ask Nancy Hall. So okay. we can, thank, you. Uh, thank you for your report. Um, appreciate all the <coughs> exciting things that are going on at MSDB. It's really wonderful. Thanks for the extra time. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next item is the Macy liaison. The turnover to Sufi Headland, our Macy liaison for the Macy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am um, pleased to report that Macy had a meeting on January 4th, and we had it was an informational meeting. We had great presentations from OPI and conversations. We also discussed Digital Academy and the Indigenous Language Program, as well as um, had a presentation on the seal of biodiversity from Director McCall Flynn. So um, we had a really great meeting. Um, one thing that really stood out to me was how um, engaging it was and how involved and thoughtful the comments were. And um, our chair, which I will turn it over to here shortly, Jordan Langford, um, she even made a comment at the end of the meeting that um, it's hard to get that good feeling and that energy, that positive energy sometimes over Zoom meetings, but it was such a, a great meeting that we all felt that way. So, um, of course, it's um, a lot better when you can meet in person and, and be face to face and gives more opportunity for that to happen. But even over Zoom, we had um, such an enriching meeting that we felt really, really great and positive about the way that makes it moving forward. So, um, that was excellent. And I'll turn it over to our chair, Jordan Lankford. Welcome, Jordan. Good morning, friends and former colleagues. <laughs> um, it's great to see you all. Happy New Year. Um, thank you, Susie. I would like to add to that um, or reiterate that it's really great to hear during those meetings, especially from the American Indian Administration at OPI. Um, those folks are working diligently and it's just really great to see their commitment. And we also had some updates from Superintendent Arnson as well that were really great. And it's just always amazing to see Montana's forward momentum. Today, we do not have any action items for you and I apologize for any confusion. So we originally, made an all call for the tribal college presidents to apply for that vacant spot on the Macy board. And so we got um, those three applicants that you should see in your packet. However, in the past two days, I've learned that the tribal college presidents met as a group and they themselves voted for a nomination. So um, during our February meeting, that's when Macy will vote to approve that. And then we will bring that individual for your approval for the following meeting. I apologize for that. I just think it's important though, if that group is saying, this is who we want to represent us, I wanna do it right. And I wanna honor and respect that. And so I would prefer to bring forward the uh, applicant that they voted on. So sorry for that confusion. Um, oh, sorry, what? No problem. Thank you for the clarification. And I think we agree with that decision. Great. Um, thank you. Um, so next month, we will bring forward a candidate to fill that vacant spot. And then additionally, two items that we discussed during Macy during the comments was we would like to request the affirmation and continued support of Macy's two position statements. One of those position, position statements being on language protections within Montana public schools, and then also the continued support and affirmation of our statement on regalia and the protections of our students wearing tribal regalia to public celebrations. The other thing that we discussed is we discussed the now retracted draft resolution concerning reservations. Um, we discussed how unfortunate it is that a Montanan would bring that or construct that to bring it forward, although it has been retracted. I think that this is just a reminder to all of us that as far as we've come with Indian Education for All, I think that we can still continue those efforts and continue those supports. 
So um, to conclude, I would also just really like to extend a thank you to Susie and McCall. I've really valued their relationship and also their guidance and their support during all of this. And I think that the more that we continue to move forward together, the Board of Public Ed and the Office of Public Instruction, the stronger we will become. And it just really starts with open dialogue and good open relationships. And I just really, really appreciate their continued support. So that's all I have. Thank you, Jordan. Um, thank you, Jordan. Thanks for your time today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, are there, go ahead. Are there any, <laughs> thank you. Are there any questions from the board? For Jordan and I? Um, sorry, I have a question. I, I, actually, Jordan, I'm not clear what your request is related to language protection and regalia. Yes, it's not, it's not necessarily an action item. What we're looking for is just your continued support. I know that last year, after our regalia statement was approved, it was really pushed out and reiterated by the Board of Ed. Um, so if you have the capacity, even in your own communities, to continue that information. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, we talked about it quite a bit at the meeting, um, just the importance of making sure that uh, we continue to acknowledge those and share the information and work with our partners. Um, to get the word out. So at, for example, I did a presentation last year at my regional mass superintendent meeting on the statements and will um, ask to do that again because we need to continually inform the public and our colleagues um, about the statements and the importance of them. So we thought it would be a good idea just to revisit it at um, the Board of Public Ed meeting as well. Uh, Headland, I think that's a great idea, and I think March is a timely um, time to, especially with the regalia uh, pieces, we're looking towards graduations and all of the ceremonies that happen towards the end of the year. I think that reminder is really important, so I think that's great. Can I add something, too, that I forgot to mention? Um, yeah. Something, Something that I asked for during my chairperson report last meeting for Macy was that if any board member is particularly passionate about a subject or they're seeing something concerning or something that they would like to bring forward, I asked all of our members to begin drafting position statements of their own. And the reason that I asked that is because I don't want to be reactionary. The reason that we wrote our position statement on the language protections and also for regalia is that was the consequences of a reaction. And so what I would like to see from Macy moving forward is we already have those statements in place. If an event were to occur, we already have that ready to go, right? Because if something happens, then it comes to Macy's attention. And then we gather as smaller committees. And then, you know, before you know it, it's six months to a year before we have this uh, position statement for whatever it is in place. And I would like to see our board members begin just drafting their ideas so it's no longer reactionary. We can. Um, just stand up as a Macy board and say, this is our position statement on this. This is our position statement on this. This is our position statement on this. I really value the diversity of our Macy board and the feet on the ground that we have and everybody working in their individual facets. So I'd, I'm just asking that if there's anything that you see that you are passionate about or you see going on in your community that you feel Macy needs to have a position statement on, please begin thinking about that and or drafting it because I would rather be proactive than reactionary in the future. Final questions? All right, thanks again, Jordan. And I'll turn it back over to you, Madam Chair. And I just thank you as well, Jordan. And we're ready to move to our licensure committee. And that is Susie Edlin. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. We will move forward to item nine, the annual teacher licensure report. And I will turn it over to Crystal Ann. Thank you, Good morning. It has been a while. I'm Madam Chair Twinlin and members of the Board of Public Ed. Uh, my name is Crystal Andrews. A-N-D-R-E-W-S for the record. 
I am the director of educator licensure at UPI, and it's so very good to see you all. I am here today to provide an overview of the 2022-23 teacher licensure data report. A little background on this year's report. I can happily say that I did not have to use tally marks or count licenses <laughs> by hand. Yay. Our new licensure system is equipped with providing the data, um, and it was lovely. <laughs> Although it was still a lot of work to get it in front of you in the format it is, um, it, it was far easier than years past. And Dr. Mergle can attest to that. It was not an easy task. <laughs> so, um, the licensure system is working in many ways for us. So thank you. Um, please refer to the board packet starting on page, I believe, 125, if I was correct. Okay. Um, what you will find in this document is a summary of educator licensure activity impacting fiscal year 22-23. However, please note that the data is from January 1st of 2022 through December 23rd of 2022. So it really captures both the 21-22 school year and the 22-23 school year. Uh, the areas included, uh, licenses are issued for, so we have several tables for you to see. Um, renewals, upgrading from one class to another and adding an endorsement. Those obtaining their initial Montana educator license, so the class of the license and endorsement area. Emergency authorizations of employment issued to school districts in the subject areas a list of license class and endorsement areas that were denied, a list of license class and endorsement areas that were unusual cases, and then a view of the number of newly hired educators in the critical shortage areas. And in conclusion is just a good visual of a license, licensure history for new hires along with renewals for the past five years. Um, so starting on, oh, and then the next two pages was, I think, a request last year just to give you a little refresher of what each class we license is um, as it is in each table. So I wanted to include that again for you. And it did um, come with a few of the changes that were for Chapter 57 goals. I've included on that as well. Um, so starting on page 128 in your packet is the first table for renewals, upgrades, and adding endorsement to a current license again, from January 1st through De December 23rd of 2022. This is any activity that an educator completed to keep or upgrade a license. So our total number is very similar to last year, and you will see later on in that the data for renewals has been very stable for the past five years, which is a good thing. Um, and I'm just gonna keep going. Please feel free, Chair Hedlund, if you wanna enter, you know, if you wanna do questions throughout, I'm totally fine with that, um, or at the end, so I'm just gonna keep rolling. That'll be it. <laughs> Thank you. Starting on um, page 132 is the information for new licenses for 2022. It comes as no surprise that we have seen a significant drop in initial licensure with almost 500 fewer applications than last year. This is clear evidence that the recruitment efforts that the OPI along with Montana's EPPs and districts is crucial for increasing the number of new license holders in our state. On page 135 is the information for emergency authorization of employment. The tables are grouped by subject and then by district. And remember an emergency authorization is issued to a school district and not to an individual. It is not a license. I do want to mention that the data does not reflect our current numbers for emergency off for this school year. Remember, the data is only through the 23rd of December. And since then, we have issued a total of 150 emergency authorizations, actually. Yes. Madam Chair, is, is that 150 additional or 150 total? Total. Okay. total. Thank you. Um, another seven applications are marked deficient, and the districts are working on them. Another five are pending payment. Another 16 applications are pending due to waiting for fingerprint background checks from the DOJ. And another 33 applications have been started and not completed. So since the process is new this year in terms of being inside the teacher, um, Teach Montana platform, I've asked my uh, licensure specialist to diligently reach out to those 61 applicants to help with te technical questions, just in case it is more on that side of it. So those 61 additional applications that are in the system, we have been reaching out to currently. Yeah. Um, can you tell us who is that specialist? My licensure team? 
Yeah. Oh, who is on the life center team now? Um, so it's Lori Weiss, Becky Flanagan, and Virginia Bannon. Okay. She's been with Diaz and she got married last year, so Virginia Bannon's. Okay. I'm sure I have a question on my page 136. It's table 3B. What do the asterisks mean next to the numbers? I, don't, I just didn't see a key. Maybe I missed it as I was scrolling. Um, the key is actually on the page before. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, and so I did this this year because last year it was a question and I fumbled along with it. And I guess having a year and I tried to be a little <laughs> bit more <laughs> um, helpful, but maybe it wasn't. So the asterisks are the um, the first asterisk is uh, just stating that they were included in 21's licensure report. So like I said, the data is captured for the year. So some of those emergency authorizations were actually for the prior school year and not for this school year. So I wanted to capture that just because it's um, in the second table, it's by districts. So you can really see what districts have them for this year, um, or maybe it was just for last year. Um, sorry, if it created more confusion than words, I can. Um, change that, and then no, it's um, just was and then the the asterisk next to the one hundred number one hundred thirty nine is just saying um, that number is obviously higher than the other table. Um, it's because some emergency authorizations are in two different endorsement areas, so that's why the number um, is different. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Um. So as I said, the data is not a clear picture for emergency authorizations. And I just really wanted to share where we stand with that because it is something that I know um, everyone is interested in. You know, how many teachers out there are um, not licensed or using that emergency authorization? So if all the applicants that are in the system get approved, our total for the 22, 23 year would be 211 emergency authorizations, which is a it's higher than last year, I believe it was 186, but that trend makes sense um, due to our teacher shortage. Any other questions on emergency authors? Okay. Um, starting on page 137 is good news is that there were only three denial cases this year. One of the academic cases actually ended up working with the new rules. Um, so she was a teacher that had a degree in middle grade. <laughs> and opted for that license instead of the elementary. So truly there were only two um, fully denied cases this year. Um, and then below that starts many unusual cases, some of which you were a part of. Um, I have noted the cases that they have approved by the board and then the ones starting with the superintendent um, that, had, that she had reviewed and approved. There were a total of 23 cases, um, all of which were approved. Since the new year, uh, the superintendent has approved three more cases, all of which had similar situations and as the case that had already been approved in the past. So we really are seeing some trends within our requests. Um, the class five extension being one um, due to COVID this past year, you know, it was still something classwork wasn't finished or they weren't able to get their student teaching in. Um, another one was, um, we had a couple of school counselors that were coming in and didn't have 600 internship hours, but had like 10 years of experience. And I know the board approved one and then the superintendent did another. So we are seeing similar cases, um, which makes life easier for me in terms of writing the unusual case letters, but it's also good for us to see and kind of think through as we go on. I know we still have time before our next revision, thank goodness, <laughs> but um, you know, to think through some of those that we are seeing, and I am tracking those making sure that we know, you know, just so it's a good topic for when we are looking at rules again. Um, and so where am I here? So the final table starting on page 139 is new licenses that were issued in the field of critical endorsement shortages um, that I know you'll be hearing more about later today from Jay Phillips. And as we saw in the new license table, there has been a significant decrease which would make sense, making it very hard for districts to fill positions without relying on the emergency authorizations. The final information I'd like to share on the next page is just a visual of the first two tables. It is a clear picture of the decline in initial licenses, along with a steady number of renewals, upgrades, and added endorsements. My hope is with all the efforts in place to support recruitment 
and retention in our state that our numbers get drastic increase in 2023. And I plan to do everything I can to help support that. So thank you very much for your time and I stand for any questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, thorough report. So I just, and I think I've asked this question before, but just want to make sure that I am clear about it. Within the renewal upgrades and added endorsements, that includes anybody, for example, that's an elementary principal and then finished their superintendent's endorsement. Um, and got and added that new endorsement. They're included in these numbers, not in the initial license numbers. Is that correct? Madam Chair Flynn and Board Member Lacey, that is correct because they're adding it onto a, an actual license. So they would have a class three license currently with that principal and they're adding on to it that superintendent. So it would be in that table. Yeah. And then and there's no way to tell that in this table. In that this table, no, but I now have ways of getting data to you. Um, so if you would like that, I, like <laughs> well, I just think that would be good to maybe tease that out and pull it out because what we can't tell is how many new people are interested in being a superintendent in, in our state. So like it looks like there are three, I think in the second table, the superintendent listed three new initial licenses. And you're like, oh, that's only three. But there could have been, I mean, I think the superintendent's 90 or something. I mean, it could have been 60 new people that have newly added the superintendent's endorsement on, but we can't tell that. And so it looks dismal and it might not be actually because we don't have the, the, that kind of level of detail. But three new is terrible. <laughs> three new is terrible, but you know, again, we don't know of the 90, um, I'm trying to find it here. It's on the um, ones, uh, 91, sorry. So there were 91 endorsements in superintendent. How many of those truly were just renewals? Somebody's had their superintendent for a long time and renewed it. And, or how many of those 91 are brand new people that have just, receive their endorsement in the superintendent. I think we should tease that out a little bit in the future. And I know it messes up your longitudinal numbers, but maybe we could start a new chart that shows that. You could do both with the new system since you don't have the talent. Yeah, Madam Chair uh, Quinlan and Board Member Lacey, I agree. And I think now that I have the capacity to really um, dive into it, and I am sort of a data geek, I guess you'd say, um, I, I think that would be super beneficial. I think it would also benefit to include internships because we do have superintendent internships, principal internships. Um, and, I, and although that was included in years past, it wasn't a solid because they would be coming in um, from our EPPs. It wasn't, I didn't feel it was very valid. And now that it, we have a smooth process within the Teach Montana system, it, it is definitely accurate data. So I'd love to include that as well. Thank you. And I think uh, as a follow up, you know, we've increased pathways to endorsements, all of these, many of these endorsements that are listed here. And I think we kind of need to know, is that working? And the only way we know that is to know what new endorsements have been added onto already existing licenses. So I think that kind of granular detail will help us know if the rule changes made any difference or not. Um, can I just have a follow-up? So what I hear you saying is really separating all three of those things out into its own table. And I think that that would get capture that data for us. Yes, the- um, The renewals. Yes, the renewals, and upgrades, and adding an endorsement if those were three. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I would love to do that. And if you would like, I could have that for the next meeting or even just get it from a call. Um, and to share with you whichever you would support, whatever the board's pleasure is. Mm -hmm. Just sending it on to the call. Okay. Mm -hmm. That would be important. Thank you. And number one. I was just going to say, and I hope you don't do that just for superintendents, but you'll right. do that across. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just that was <laughs> good point because I used one example yeah. and it <laughs> should be broader for sure. Yeah. Dr. McLean. Thank you. 
uh, thank you so much uh, for the great report. One of the questions I had, and I think it goes back to a question you asked last year when this report was made, um, is on the emergency off schedule. Um, yeah, please, yeah. Oh, is on the emergency authorization schedule. You have January 1st to December 23rd. So in effect, two parts of two different academic years. Mm -hmm. I guess I was just wondering what the, what the thought is behind that, I guess. Because we get two different parts of two different years. Well, the report is for the, the year of 2022, which then would capture two. We, I mean, I'm still getting emergency authorizations in currently. I'm sure I have some waiting for me for this school year. So we wouldn't have been able to provide you with a full report if we waited, you know, for the end of this year because it isn't something that has a strict deadline. I can tell you this year there are more um, superintendents reaching out to me about teachers leaving mid-year or you know what do we do should i get an emergency off so, on? so this year i'm seeing more coming in later than um you know in years past or at least last year when i was uh, doing them it was more a really heavy lift in august of that you know that summer when they know right away but this year there has been more coming in later because teachers are leaving the field during the school year um so that's why it's two different years. And that's why I wanted to indicate that on the table to show like some of them are the end of last year, you know, that we didn't capture last year because they came in after the December. So it's just looking at, and I mean, it, I can tell you last year's final number was 186, um, you know, with all of them, including, including the few on here. Um, so this year we're looking towards about 211 if, if they're all included, the ones that we have. So 21 to 22 was the 180. And then, so, and then what, what did you say was 22 to 23? Right now we're at 150, exactly. Um, but within the, the ones that are in the system and my team's working to, you know, just make sure the districts are understanding what needs to be finished, we're, we're looking at 211. For just the academic year? For the 22 to 23. And it could be more if you know, I think yeah. Okay, so any other questions? I'm wondering, Crystal, if the people leave in mid year, do we have any exit interview data um, as to when they left and why? Are we capturing that and putting it together? Madam Chair Quinlan um, and Board Member Hannon, I don't know that. I think that would be really a global decision. I would think it'd be at a district level. I think it's an excellent idea. Um, from the ones that I'm hearing, in terms of superintendents calling me, asking what can we do, and sharing, you know, this teacher's left, it's for leaving the field of education altogether. Um, I'd say. I can tell you three I know of that, um, and another getting a job within a different, you know, part of education, a consulting or something like that. So um, that's just word of mouth. I, you know, I don't, I don't know, but that is happening within the districts. But I think that's a great idea. Yeah. If people are leaving education, I'd like to know why. If there's any way we can start to collect that I just point out one bright spot <laughs> on the new license uh, history in the fields of critical endorsement shortages. Um, if you look at the career and technical education trend, um, that's pretty exciting. In 2018, there were 22 new licenses. 20, in 2022, 58. Um, so I think our conversations um, around our communities about career and technical education, um, it's starting to catch on. And I think it's uh, borne out in that data there. So thank you. OK, thank you. That will conclude um, item 9. And we will move on to item 10, which is the ETS practice test review timeline update. And I will once again turn it over to Crystal Andrews and Christy Patrick. All right. Um, so again, my name is Crystal Andrews, I am the R-E-W-S. I am the Director of Educator Licensure, and I forgot that. 
that and now um, also accreditation uh, at some of the public instruction. So, um, and I am joined with. <laughs> and you tell we work together a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Our similar hats. Yes. So, Christy Steinberg, I am um, in the Phillips J. Washington College of Education at the University of Montana. I introduced myself at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I'm here at the sitting at the table right now um, because I work on the Praxis Working Committee. We like our acronym. So, the PWC is. Um, a body made up of all 10 educator preparation programs, public, private, tribal, um, in the state of Montana, and we meet regularly to, as part of the Montana Deans of Education, um, to deal with issues related to praxis. So I kind of walk through these steps as we do them at the state level um, on behalf of the EPs. So for uh, today, our Montana's current praxis test in biology, general science, Earth and space sciences, chemistry, physics, school counseling, and school librarian will expire and no longer be available after August 30th, 2023. So we are here today to share information gathered from expert panels in each area, the practice working committee um, recommendation, along with the Montana, Montana Council of Teams recommendation. So this is starting in your packet on page 143. And as Christy already so eloquently shared what this is all about, I will let her share a little background <laughs> and um, the recommendation uh, for to lead this effort. Um, and then I'll kind of go over the timeline after that. Event. Thank you. So um, as Crystal described, we brought together um, P12 educators plus post-secondary um, faculty and content areas and in educator preparation programs to review these revised tests. None of these tests are new for the state of Montana. We've had these tests. Um, these tests, though, were revised by ETS, Educational Testing Services, who runs these tests. Um, they look at any new kind of standards. They look at new questions. So they do this on a national level as part of that organization. Um, and then <clears throat> ETS, who, who have praxis, then sets up um, what they recommend as scores. So we brought participants read, um, together in the state of Montana to review those tests and decide um, what we feel is an appropriate score for these tests. Again, this is either content knowledge test, new to the profession, what is the minimum knowledge that a teacher needs in their content area? Um, and so Crystal coordinated um, the participation in each of these tests. We had teachers on all of them, um, with the exception, I believe, of the Earth and Space Science test, where we had two um, post-secondary educator prep program um, faculty review that. I think some of that's just the nature of some of these tests and how many people are teaching that. General science obviously had a lot more participation, including four teachers um, and representing a, a wide variety. So um, school counseling, we had two school counselors and three um, EPP faculty on that. And then librarians, as we know, are always wanting to participate. <laughs> um, and so we had a whole group of um, school librarians representing K-12, um, like elementary librarians, middle school librarians, high school librarians, big districts, small districts, um, along with the three EPPs in the state who prepare school librarians. And so we met, we had really good conversations among all of those groups. Um, even if they agreed with um, and liked the test, we had really good conversations about those tests, where the score should be, what we thought about the content of the test, and then um, each of the panels at the end of October landed on what their recommended scores. Um, so the recommended scores came from the panels that were then taken to the process working committee um, and then to the council of teams. And you can see on page two of the member memo from the council of teams um, the recommendations. So today we're here to just share these recommendations. I will be bringing the same information to CISVAC um, two weeks, I think two weeks in a day or something like that. And then I'll be back to um, present to you in March and ask for your approval. Oh, yes. so today is just informational uh, and we will do it as an action item in March. So on page two, you'll see for biology, uh, the Council of Deans unanimously recommends the use of the 5236 practice, practice test, and that's the new test, uh, with a score of 1. 54 um, for educator licensure purposes in Montana. This was a score that was recommended by ETS. 
also recommended by both the other entities, so the panel and the practice committee. General science, um, Sandy unanimously recommended the use of the 5436 general science and the score of 141. Um, and the caveat to this was to, uh, with a plan to review the score in two years, autumn of 2024. You said that's, that date was because it's to give time, correct? Correct. So these tests became active. These new regenerated tests became active September 1, but the old test is still in place. So all of our Montana completers are taking the old test because we haven't done anything with these scores setting new tests yet or net new scores um, with these tests yet. So um, even though the new test is out, Montana um, educators won't be starting to take those until these scores are set likely in fall of 23. So we wanted to have enough data and enough test takers to evaluate that. So that's why the two year window came out. And that was just, um, these are new tests. We don't have data, um, really make national data on these, let alone Montana data on these. So that was one where they're like, is this score really where we want it to be? Are we putting people in who should be in the field or not leaving people out that should be in? So that was one of the conversations with the general science. Um, and you'll see that same recommendation with libraries. Let, let's just look at those in two years. And that's really what the Praxis Working Committee does. Um, anytime any of the EPPs or educators or districts come to us and say, hey, people aren't doing well on the Spanish test. We look at this and we sit down and we look at those scores and we can look at them statewide. Um, as well. And so that was part of that recommendation for science. It's just like, hey, you know, we're comfortable with this, but can you look at it again in a couple of years just to make sure that our educators are doing well on that? Um, so for Earth and Space Science, uh, like Christine said, there were only two representatives, um, which were both from EPPs, and they agreed with the score of 154. And as I say this, this is all the recommended scores from um, ETS. So that every single one is their what their recommendation was, and of course um, Nick Bellick, who is our ETF representative, shared how those scores came about. Um, lots of data, lots of you know their own internal panel um, working group that got to that score. Um, chemistry, uh, the new test is five two four six is a score of one forty forty six um, for Montana. And that was passed again across the board. Physics, uh, 5266 with a score of 146. Same. 5, 145. Did I do six? Yeah, sorry. It's a, lot of a lot of numbers. 5266 and a score of 145. Uh, school counselor was uh, unanimously recommended for 5422 um, with a score of 145. For educator license or purposes. Um, and it is to note that the test is not required for K prep accredited programs at U of M and MSU. And then school librarian uh, was a lengthy conversation, and our you know panel was split. And as Christy shared, we had uh, a very large group, and what, what we both um, said at the end was they didn't all agree. Um, but we're very professional and you could tell respected each other in terms of uh, some wanted to sort of be higher, some wanted to leave it as is, but they had a really rich conversation about it. And it was just really great to see that collaboration and dedication to do something that they're so passionate about. Um, so they did land on the recommended score from ETS of 154. Um, but as Christine said, with the caveat of reevaluating in two years, um, once we have some data to see if that score is too low, um, and that and, and we would say we should do that in August, autumn of 2024. On the next uh, page, you can see our test review timeline, um, and we're towards the end of it. It, it was um, a lot trying to get so many tests at once, and you know we did it in the fall so that we had time. To get it in front of you. Uh, I will say that we'll have two new tests coming um, English is the second language and then American Sign Language that are new tests that we'll need to be creating panel for and get in front of you as well um, this spring. Um, so those are upcoming. So, as I said, my next step is to bring this back on the 27th with the same information on um, gaining their recommendation for you um, for the board. And then I will come back to March and present their recommendation and 
uh, to seek your approval. Stand for any questions. Yeah, Madam Chair, Crystal, I'm sure you know ETS hires all the big shot psychometricians and all of that to figure it out. What do other states do? Do they accept their recommendations from ETS, or are other states going up much higher or much lower than what they recommend? Uh, great question, um, Madam Chair, and any member of Tharp. Um, we do see that as part of the presentation that ETS shares, and all but one state goes with the recommendation of typically, as we saw with seven presentations, um, is, 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 tends to always be a little bit lower than the recommended score. But other than that, every state would take the recommended. Yeah. Can you see some movement on those scores over time as states get more data and they see that, yes, this is too high or it's too low mm -hmm. and we're getting people who aren't qualified? Most of them use that as a starting point and then move from there as they kind of see their own data. But they do present to us, here's what the other scores um, are for states and that have adopted the test. And they also shared that. So each of these panels have the ability to see what is Idaho doing, what is North Dakota doing. Good. Um, Good. Uh, Crystal, just one question on the sign language test. For interpreters, I know they already have a way of testing and they're classified at, you know, I, I believe it's you have to be a level four to be in the school, for example. So what is the purpose or who are we using that practice for? Madam Chair, for my, my board member, Hedlund. Um, so this is actually considered a world language. So it's teaching American Sign Language, not using it for interpreters. For okay, people. thank you. And we actually have got quite a few that was one unusual case um, just this past a few months ago where we don't have a program to provide for that, but with our new rules, we can add that endorsement and people that are coming from other states that have that background, we need the test um, to use so that we can use it as that. Um, so it's teaching it, not using it for interpreting. Thank you for playing. All right. Any final questions? Uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to take a minute and uh, thank uh, you, Crystal, and um, the Office of Public Instruction for always including us and uh, you uh, for being such a good representative of the university system. Crystal, in this important conversation, I remember it uh, emanating at almost all of our visits during the Chapter 57 conversation, and uh, we just couldn't have it. Before. And do it with others. So, thank you for having me. All right, I believe that concludes our item 10. And thank you very much for joining us. Hope you leave. We will now move to item 11. We have the virtual joint site and site exit report of the University of Montana Educator Preparation Program. And I will turn it over to Dr. Murdahl. Good and, morning. And I would just like to add good morning, Dr. Murdahl. Um, if we can get through the next two items by noon, that would be really swell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. I will say good afternoon instead of morning for Chair Quinlan and Chair Chair Hedlund. Thank you so much. So uh, I will get through these two items for you. By you. So um, I am Julie Merkel, spelled M U R G E L, for the record, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Montana Office of Public Instruction. And so I have two presentations for you today regarding um, um, Educator Preparation Program accreditation under Chapter 58. So the first item is number uh, item number 11 in your form packet for page 147. Joining me still at the table is Christy Steinberg, representing the University of Montana at the Phyllis J. Washington College of Education. So we have presented this to you back in January as a draft and informational item, and we are here today to uh, seek approval. So the state superintendent recommends approval of the 2022 state exit report of the EPP at Phyllis J. Washington of Education at the University of Montana. The state superintendent, Arnson, also recommends approval of regular accreditation effective through, and I want to know it won't be spring, it'll be fall of 2027 to align with CAPE uh, because 
their review will be need to be in the spring of 2027, but um, the, the approval needs to stay in place until um, the new process gets through. Uh, so that I share that with you. The reason why you guys, it is 2027, the seven year cycle always stays. And so if at some point somebody requests an extension, it doesn't mean that they're, that, that then the seven year starts over on the clock that then becomes six years. So I just want to note that. Um, and so what you will find in your packet is an overview of this joint process. So you'll see the, the review of the subchapter 500s, of uh, being met in those areas um, across for the state review. And then you will see that both for CAPE, the initial standards review for initial programs and the advanced programs at the University of Montana have met those as well. Um, and so you see within the report recommendations. And so I would turn it over to Dr. Steinberg to have anything that you would like to say or add um, about this process or anything that is in, within this report um, that you would like to share with us. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cargill. Um, and online today, um, joining via Zoom are Professor Morgan Allwell, who's the Department Chair of Teaching and Learning, and Professor John Mack, who's the Department Chair of Educational Leadership. So they're joining remotely. I am here in person. My Dean and Associate Dean are have other obligations this afternoon. So I'm here on the behalf and you saw Dr. Lee when this was originally presented. So we'd just like to thank everybody for their time. Thank Dr. Mergel for her leadership um, as we went through this process. It's exhausting. And considering that, the, that it was, um, you know, you start in summer of the previous year doing all of the materials and submitting those through the visit in April to finally in January landing here. Um, it was a long process, but we've learned a lot um, through the process. We're very pleased with the fact that we've met all the standards. Um, they have some recommendations for us, but that's what continuous improvement is about. Um, and we are moving forward with, with those things through both of our departments. Um, <clears throat> And so it was a very positive experience. And I'm going to get us out by noon and I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Steinberg. Are there any questions of the board? All right, I'm going to make a motion. Back to you for a motion. Okay. I move to approve the state exit report and regular accreditation status of the Montana Ed Educator Preparation preparation provider. I'm talk, trying to talk too fast. In the Phyllis J. Washington College of Education at the University of Montana, as recommended by the Bridge Network. Second, is there a second? Okay. Uh, is, it's been moved uh, by, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Board Member Hedlin, Hedlin and a seconded by Board Member Lacey. Is there public comment? Is there Board Member comment? Uh, we'll make no wait till the vote. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing no comment, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, no. Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, I just want to take a moment and congratulate uh, you and all of the team at uh, the school uh, in Missoula, the University of Montana. Uh, this is no easy feat. Uh, it is no easy feat, especially in times of um, uh, the staffing challenges and uh, so many other challenges that are occurring not just at the University of Montana, but perhaps on other campuses and certainly in our K-12 schools right now. But um, just no easy feat and just a sincere heartfelt congratulations and thank you for the great work. And to you folks, uh, Morgan and uh, uh, Dr. Matt, uh, good to see you both and congratulations to you as well. Thank you, Wilson. Thank you. Sure. Yes, we appreciate all of you joining us today and, and all of your work. I, it's a very in-depth report. Spent a lot of time on it. So, all right. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to item 12 action on the state exit report and regular accreditation status of the Montana Educator Preparation Program at the University of Providence. And I will turn it over to Dr. Merkel. Thank you, Board Chair Hedlund. I just want to double check um, Chris uh, in uh, Dr. Leslie Lott of online from the University of Providence for her to join us. I'm here. Welcome. Thank Great. you. So you guys, the purpose of this um, 
today is to recommend approval for the um, um, upgrade from provisional accreditation to full accreditation for the University of Providence uh, and for their educator preparation program. So this starts in your package on 185. Um, and so I do want to just take a moment to kind of just quickly overview kind of why we are with you today on this particular piece from the University of uh, Providence. And so um, in the process and timeline, um, you will see on page, uh, it's like within there, this is the final step that has to happen for a provisional accreditation. So as you go through this report, you'll see um, within the report on page three, it's going to be about 188-ish or 89-ish. You'll see a yellow piece there. The last step that has to happen was number 10 where um, they have gone through, they did everything that they were supposed to to bring this program forward and a site visit had to occur and review the final set of audit of their, their institutional reports of them being able to meet the standards in two areas, which was the elementary education and physical um, health and physical education. As you guys know, the University of Providence had a program um, it ceased to exist in 2019, that it came back on board, but it came back forward on a new fashion, which is these two endorsement areas. And so that had to have a provisional accreditation process of which we did. And so this was the final step so that they could move to full accreditation. And so that site visit did occur, review of all the evidence and documents um, in uh, this past October. And so you'll see the status in the report on page six. Um, this is not a joint review, so it didn't have CAPE with it. So it's a full state review. So the state was responsible for reviewing all of the standards of the 300s, the 500s uh, all together. Uh, so knowing that this program does not have an advanced level uh, programming at the University of Providence, there were no 600s or 700s reviewed. What I'll note for you at a very high level and give Leslie an opportunity to kind of share with you. Uh, there are some really great highlights happening at the University of Providence that I would share with you. They have a great assessment system. They are doing a great job of data. They have these incredible different performance metrics that they're using of how they're looking at their candidates in multiple ways from you know, uh, educational pedagogy to the content um, and looking at these across all of the programming. And it's really strong of how they bring their team together. Um, it's a small but mighty team together of looking at this data and following their candidates from the initial all the way through the, the uh, clinical experience. They have yet to have someone complete the clinical experience until the spring from this new program, just so that you know. Um, uh, and that person transitioned from the old program into the new program, so they're still somewhat in transition. But I just want to highlight that they've also done a really good job of integrating trauma and restorative practices into their classrooms and into their curriculum. And I would also tell you that um, They've done a good job of thinking about being sure that the students have field experience prior to that final student teaching and at all levels at the at the elementary and the middle so like their k-8 teachers are not just getting um, elementary uh, field experience they're getting both middle and elementary for example and then the k-12 folks that are getting the health and PE endorsements are getting opportunities throughout their time in the program at all levels, um, elementary, middle, and high. And I think that's a highlight. Where we identified areas, you guys, where you'll see some areas for improvement and recommendations for them to continue to improve, really come around that last piece that we were speaking about, which is their clinical partnerships. They haven't completely mapped that out. Um, and so um, they've got to reconnect uh, with, um, in particular, the school district in, in the city in which they reside, Great Falls Public School, re-engage that partner, really start thinking about the, the student teaching opportunities there, um, and then being able to measure that. So it's really, you can't really measure, if you will, like they're showing, they've got all the documents ready to go, they've got the processes ready to go, but it, we couldn't give them a full match because we didn't have evidence that had actually been completed. Um, so that's why it's coming in as an area for improvement, because they'll have to take those documents and do that. Um, they'll have to collect completer surveys 
after someone has completed the program, how satisfied are they with the program and did it really prepare them? They'll have to then, once they get completed and somebody does land in a position to reach out to the employer as well to say, how well did you feel our candidate was prepared through our program to be a teacher? So that's kind of the reason why those areas were coming in as met but with some area for improvement. They've got the pieces there, the systems there, the processes there, it just has to take place. But that would not prevent them from moving from a provisional to our recommendation for full accreditation. The last piece that I would say is within the reading, we did recommend within the elementary endorsement, they're using communications arts one and two um, and reading in the content courses to really kind of take a look at the theory of reading. Um, and really strengthen that to an evidence-based program around um, a shift more to a brain-based approach, if you will, to the science of reading, which we're seeing more and more of that need across our programming to say, let's really strengthen for our teachers the ability to know how to teach reading. So to share that with you, I'd love to turn it over to Dr. Lott to share anything that she has with you or any questions that you might have uh, about this process. Thanks. You bet. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to look through our materials and especially Dr. Mergel for spending time on our campus and speaking to staff and faculty and our students and getting a feel for our program and for the, the response we were given on things we can work on. We're definitely taking that into consideration and we'll work um, really thoroughly on that to ensure those are in place during our next accreditation visit. And I'm welcome, I, I'd love to have it answer questions. And I also know it's 1156 and I clearly heard we wanna end by noon. So if you have any questions, I'm willing to answer those. Is it Dr. Lott, is that correct? Yes, it Professor, is. you can call me Professor Lott, yep. <laughs> Professor Lott, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate all of your work and I'm uh, really interested in, uh, glad that Dr. Virgil highlighted your areas of strength, I think, it's incredible that you're offering those field experiences and wish I would have had the opportunity to have a field experience in elementary as well as junior high. So that really stands out to me as well. Um, are there any other comments or questions from board members? Madam Chair, I would uh, just like to say hello to Professor Lott. Um, sadly, I was not I was on the board of trustees in 2019 when we sadly eliminated the, these programs. Um, I'll never forget that day, how difficult that was as I was sitting there as the superintendent of Great Falls Public Schools, knowing um, what was going to be happening here for the future of not having enough candidates for our elementary teaching positions in particular. That was a sad day. Um, and this is just like a great exclamation point at the end of a long process that at my last board meeting here, uh, we get to approve the reinstatement of these programs. It's very exciting. I know it's taken a lot of work. It's taken a huge commitment uh, by a lot of the University of Providence staff. Um, but I know the Great Falls community is definitely behind you. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, and uh, this is uh, board member Quinlan. I just like to add to that. I was on the board of public ed when um, the University of Providence was considering getting rid of it or looking at eliminating its educator preparation program. And I just want to say it's good to have you back. <laughs> Thank you. Good to be back. All right. I am prepared to make a motion. Back to you for a motion. I move to approve the state exit report and regular accreditation status of the Montana Educator Preparation Provider at the University of Providence as recommended by Superintendent Hartson. Is there a second? Second. All right. It's been moved by Board Member Headland and seconded by Board Member Lacey to approve the exit report and the recommendation of the superintendent. Is there any public comment? Is there any board member comment? Congratulations. Congratulations. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Well, thank you. Round of applause. Thank you all. Let's do it. Okay, we're going to try to do chapter 58. Um, uh, the adoption of the notice of the role is what the action item is for us. Um, 
Can I um, turn it over to you for a question, but I'd like to make some comments. Okay. Um, so uh, I will turn it over to Board Member Headland as chair of the licensure committee, but I just wanted to make some comments to bring chapter 58 to the finish line. Um, what you are looking at in front of you in terms of the board packet for item 16 is the changes that have been made by the board since the adoption, since the publication of the um, proposed rules back in July actually got published in early August. So um, these changes that you now see in the notice of publication are as a result of our conversations both in September and November, um, it changes to those rules. I'm going to take one minute to summarize. Um, the, to highlight, we uh, in those two meetings uh, added some explicit statements that educator preparation programs need to focus on evidence-based practices that support social, emotional, behavioral, and academic needs of all students. We emphasize uh, a greater use of research and evidence for teacher candidates to develop their understanding of the teaching profession, professional practice, and assessment of student learning. Within world languages, we expanded and clarified the list of standards related to classical languages. Um, again, in pre preparing uh, educators, we emphasize the importance of helping them understand uh, the effects of childhood trauma on social, emotional, physical, and behavioral development, and then being able to apply that understanding for classroom management strategies. And then the biggest revision that we have in these uh, rules at this point are the uh, standards related to principals, supervisors, curriculum directors, and district superintendents. And they are now in their proposed form aligned to the National Educational Leadership Standards. So I just wanted to get that on the record. Um, again, uh, and then finally, I, I do want to thank um, all of the people that worked on this. This process started in November of 2020 in terms of OPI convening a task force. I'd like to thank OPI uh, for their work. Chapter 58 task force members, members of the Montana Educator Preparation Programs who provided a lot of input for the board, uh, certification standards and practices advisory council reviewed and made recommendations. And then we received uh, any number of comments from members of the public for developing and reviewing and commenting on these standards. So uh, with that, I will, uh, Turn it over to you for a motion and then we can just any. Thank you, Chair. I move to make a motion. I move to approve the notice of adoption pertaining to the amendment of our Title 10, Chapter 58, Education, Educator Preparation Program Standards and authorize filing of the notice with SOS for publication in the Montana Administrative Register. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved by board member Hedlund and seconded by board member Lacey. Is there any public comment on the motion? Is there any board member comments? Board member Rasmussen. A couple of things, um, three actually. Number one, for all those who did all the work on the stuff that we didn't get done, I, I read all of it and it was a tremendous amount of work. Uh, number two, as I was going through that and I was thinking about our, our um, um, our mandate to set minimum standards. I wondered in that voluminous set of standards for superintendents and principals, if we had, I know we just matched, which I have some problems with, as you can well imagine. Um, uh, I wondered if we went overboard and um, uh, did not set minimum standards, but actually set maximum, more toward maximum standards. So with those two comments, I will. Um, I'm sure I would comment on that. Um, I, I would just say that, or remind you that the standards here are the educated yeah. preparation of it ever Thank you, member. Uh, um, so, uh, any further board comment? Uh, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 
Oh, no. Okay. Uh, board no. member Rasmussen has voted no. That's correct. Okay. Um, the motion passes. Uh, will board member Rasmussen voted no? All right. Thank you for getting us through our morning agenda. We appreciate it. And um, Paul can tell us the details for lunch. And we will be back here at one o'clock, time certain, for a um, a licensure hearing. And I just want to let those in the audience know we're anticipating it will be a closed hearing. Uh, don't we'll look where we're headed. Okay. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, we'll, uh, we are, we uh, are.
I'll reconvene the meeting of the uh, Board of Public Ed, and um, we are on item 14. Um, uh, yes. um, okay, this is a uh, hearing of appeal of a licensure denial, and I'd like to uh, read a statement that the Montana statute allows the presiding officer of a public meeting to close a meeting during the time a discussion relates to a matter of individual privacy. If the presiding officer determines that the demand of individual privacy clearly exceeds the merits of public disclosure. As board chair, I have determined that the discussion which will now take place meets the individual privacy criteria, and we will therefore recess and reconvene in three minutes uh, in the, uh, to just make sure that um, it's only the board members who are present in the meeting. Oh, and we will come back into open session um, as soon as the hearing is concluded. All right.